Pastor Jessica Alexander of Grace Chapel of San Bernardino will lead tonight's invocation, and Ashley Molina Galdemez from Del Vallejo Leadership and STEAM Academy will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please approach the podium at this time. Please rise. Thank you so much, Mayor. Let us pray. God, we pray for our city tonight, the city of San Bernardino. We pray for all community leaders, all city staff, city residents, visitors, and friends today. We ask for your grace over them, and we pray for our mayor and city council for their wisdom. God, we pray also for their families and the sacrifices that their families have made. We pray that you would bless them and reward them. We pray for their strength, Lord, and we pray that you would help them and all of the decisions that they make today and that they would make the right decisions for the good and the promotion of good in our city and the protection of our residents. We pray for all of the people in attendance today, and for this we ask you, in your name, Jesus, I pray, amen. Please place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Jessica Alexander and Ashley Molina. Madam City Clerk, please call for the roll. Councilmember Sanchez. Here. Oops. Councilmember Ibarra. Councilmember Figueroa. Here. Mayor Pro Tem? Here. Councilmember Reynoso? Here. Councilmember Kelvin? Present. Councilmember Alexander? Here. Mayor Tran? Here. Before we conduct city business, as a friendly reminder, as elected leaders of the city, we will endeavor to be respectful to each other, our public, and especially our staff. Our behavior this evening sets the tone of our, how our residents, business community, and others view our city. We must conduct city business with professionalism and respectful behavior to build trust, credibility, and move our city forward. We shall commit to these values and foster a positive and productive work environment that is conducive to achieving our goals and effectively and efficiently. We will now move. At this time, public comments will be heard for items 1 through 13. Mayor, if I may. Yes. Um, first off, I'm going to step away, and if I may, I'm going to let Miss Eddie run the meeting tonight. Um, I want to thank her and congratulate her. This is her last meeting with the city, and she's going to run the council meeting for you all. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Eddie tonight. So thank, you. thank you. I need to backtrack a little bit. I jumped the gun. We have presentation first. <laughs> so, um, council Member Reynoso. We have the uh, March 2024 Citizen of the Month, Cameron Grant. Hey everyone, what can I say about our Citizen of the Month? <clears throat> this is a great honor and honestly, probably the most meaningful award that I'm able to give out in recognition on behalf of the city of San Bernardino. Cameron Grant has been here for a very long time. Cajon High graduate, his whole family, um, very intertwined with the community. But always, 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 when I think about Cameron Grant, I think about North End Gnarly. Cam goes by Cam Gnarly as well, for those who don't know. Cam is a rapper, singer, writer, producer of sorts. Um, but I met Cam a couple years ago at Serious Cartoons Records and Tapes. And I see my good friend Mike here, Phantom Threat, better known as Phantom Threat, um, who hosted all of these great concerts and events at a dead shopping center that I grew up and was near and dear to my heart. I only saw a grocery store on the corner of E and Marshall. I only saw a grocery store come and go, come and go, and the only thing that really survived there was Marshall's Donuts, which serves very good fried chicken as well, and a liquor store, unfortunately. And when you think about the narrative of San Bernardino in the regular kind of presentation of things like that I just mentioned, 
you don't really recognize enough of the people who are pumping the lifeblood into this city. And people like Cameron Grant, Cam Gnarly as I know him. Cam is an incredible artist that has been pumping life not only into the north end of the city, but into our downtown. When you think about the renovations that we're doing to our downtown, to our infrastructure, I think about the artists that are occupying the actual physical space. We can paint a wall many, many colors, but if no one's there to appreciate it and no one's there to give it life, it doesn't matter. And so this is the most meaningful award that I can give. So Cam, I'd like for you to come up and receive your recognition as Citizen of the Month in March 2024. A shameless plug before he uh, gives some comments here is North and Gnarly is a great album that's out streaming on all platforms. It has gotten me through some very hard times. It's gotten me through the gym. It's gotten me through long car rides. And honestly, it's made me extremely, extremely proud to be from the North End of San Bernardino specifically. So thank you, Cam. Thank you. Uh, this is, hold on, this. I've known Cam for a while, so our relationship is very informal, as you can see. Because love, it's really love. Um, Cam, I'm not going to read this to you because I feel like words on a piece of paper won't do it justice. That's why I came up here totally unprepared. I wanted to give it straight from my heart uh, because everything that you give to the city is everything that we should be building upon. So thank you. Citizen of the Month, Cam Gnarly, here's your pin and your certificate. Thank you, thank you so much. I can say something? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, I love being from San Bernardino. Uh, I love creating for my community, and I feel like that started at home. I love to just, if everyone could make a hand for my parents, because <laughs> Michael Grant, Pamela Grant, being community-oriented, it really started at home for me. So in all aspects, it was always really fundamental to give back to your community and to uplift the people around you. And I, I transferred that into my art, into my creations. My father and mother ran the North San Bernardino Junior Micros for almost 10 years, and I learned so much through watching them. So there would be no Cameron Grant, no Cam Gnarly, if not for the guidance of the Grant family as a whole. Um, and it just means so much to be able to represent my community, the Inland Empire as a whole, uh, creatively. And you know, guys like Ben Reynoso and so many other people who, you know, deserve this just as much as I do. This is for them as well, and just the creative community. And I hope that us as a group, we can come together and continue to create more moments like this one for artists like myself. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, and God bless. Mom, Dad, can you wanna come up? Take a picture with your son. Aiden walking up here was on the state championship football team with my brother, actually, at Cajon High School. Another round of applause, everyone. Thank you, council member, and thank you, Cameron Grant. Now at this time, uh, public comments will be heard for items one through 13 on the special meeting agenda. Those who wish to, wish to address matters not included on the agenda will have, to have the opportunity to do so before the conclusion of this meeting. To address the city council, everyone must complete a speaker card and provide it to the city clerk. Only those speaker cards turn into the city clerk would be allowed to address the city council. No late cards will be accepted. Each person should state their name for the record and you will have three minutes. If you require sp Spanish interpretation, we do have an interpreter on site. Please raise your hand at this time to indicate if you need translation assistance. In addition, we have interpreting listening devices available in the back. En este momento, se escucharán los comentarios públicos para dirigirse al Consejo Municipal. Cada individuo debe completar una tarjeta de orador. 
se debe completar la tarjeta de orador y entregarla a la Secretaría Municipal en este momento. Solo aquellas tarjetas de orador entregadas a la Secretaría Municipal podrán dirigirse al Consejo Municipal. No se aceptarán tarjetas tardías. Cada persona debe indicar su nombre para el registro. Si necesita una interpretación en español, tenemos un intérprete presente. Por favor, levante la mano en este momento para indicar que requiere servicios. También tenemos aparatos disponibles para escuchar la junta en español. Si no recibimos solicitud para los servicios de interpretación antes de las 9, el intérprete se retirará. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. We have three speakers, I believe. Madam City Clerk? I have two. Um, staff in the back, three. City Clerk only has two speakers. Is it three or two? Three. There are three. Okay, Sarah R., Alicia Ureña Esquivel, and Al Palazzo. Sarah R. Hi. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm speaking on um, item eight, and while I am neither opposed or in favor of it, I just wanted to underscore the importance of RFPs. Um, it seems um, it's a consent item, so it's likely to pass. But I wanted to um, remind the council, Mayor Tran, everybody up there, um, the importance of the RFPs when they're done correctly. Um, sometimes it, it does a disservice to sometimes seek the lowest RFP. Oftentimes, um, we end up having to pay a little more. In this case, it's $201,000 that is being asked um, to amend the budget or whatever. Um, so again, um, underscoring the importance of RFPs in, the, in your process, um, that goes with anything we do in the city. Uh, the one that sticks out to me right now is the bond issuance that the city managers um, headed in, and yet we don't have an RFP on file. I don't know what the reason is, um, but nonetheless, here we are approving 201,000, almost 202 thousand um, dollars to get the job done. Perhaps a better RFP would have done a better job. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Alicia Ureña Esquivel. I'm representing Old Town Baking um, Company at 999 Southeast Street. And I'm uh, speaking on number item number nine on the um, recommendation for the median project. I don't know too much about it. I was just told yesterday um, about this project. Um, and one of the things that was mentioned was that they um, are thinking of putting like a concrete barrier in the middle of um, going down E Street, which would affect us greatly. Um, we have you know, we, we decided to open our business at, um, in San Bernardino with this great opportunity of, you know, making downtown San Bernardino a little bit more, um, well, I mean, what we were told is that downtown would be the booming, you know, downtown East Street would be the booming thing, so we made a retail store in the front and everything, and now our uh, manufacturing business has become a little bit uh, bigger, so we were, we were able to install a silo um, which requires a big rig truck to back up all the way into um, through the driveway. So if the median was put there, then we wouldn't be able to um, have our flour delivered or any of our other um, pallet items that would that we have delivered on almost three times a week. So that would affect us greatly. I'm not sure what the actual project is in plan or anything. Um, like I said, I was just told about it yesterday, and we kind of. Um, last minute, you know, I made myself avail available to come to this meeting, um, but I just wanted to put that out there and see, like, what um, was actually the plan, if, like, maybe, you know, if there was another discussion about it or if, like, someone from our facility could be there um, and see what the actual plan is for that. So that's basically what my concern is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next speaker. My name is Al Palazzo. I'm speaking on the acquisition of the Harris Company. I grew up on the west side of San Bernardino, Mount Vernon, but I had big dreams. I was going to see the world, and I have, and I have traveled the world to bring back ideas to San Bernardino. First of all, the city should not be in the business of competing with the private sector. They don't need to acquire more property that's prime commercial sites. I have seen Paris renovated. When I saw the Louvre for the first time 40 years ago, it was black. I've seen London, when I came in on Cromwell Road, Knightsbridge, decay. You see none of that today. I've seen Rome renovated. It was all black, now beautiful pastel colors. My point is this. These are cities with millions of people, and we can't even renovate a few blocks downtown. The Harris Company, you guys lack vision. You have a choice. Tear it down, and you won't have a downtown. Because all the things that could be put in the Harris Company can be unique businesses, not just your run of the mill. Stacked up, 250,000 square feet, you can bring the downtown back. I've, I've been inside the Harris Company. It's been vandalized terribly. I cried. But I understand it's still sound. It can be the anchor. Today, I was going to speak well, about other things, housing. I'll do that later. But I'm telling you from experience, I spent 35 years evaluating all that development in the western portion of the county. I know development. The biggest mistake we made in this city is that we didn't appreciate our history. We tore down the California uh, um, Hotel, tore down uh, uh, the Platt Building. Uh, I, I mean, a president of the United States elevated, uh, operated the elevator there. We lacked vision. We thought because we had oldness, everything old had to go. Well, I'm older than most of you. I remember Third Street, and Third Street, most of it did need to go. But the Harris Company was a jewel, and it can be brought back. And I suspect your agenda is to tear it down. That's your choice? Man, oh man, you guys got to get out of San Bernardino. I was telling this to Mayor Miner, and he was a sweet man. He, he would send me to the redevelopment people, and they would say, well, Mr. Palazzo, wonderful idea, but we don't have the money for that. And I said, you don't get it. It's the free markets that's going to rebuild San Bernardino. The first point in my vision that took me 10 years to develop, San Bernardino does not have the money and it never will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Madam City Clerk? Yes. Thank you. But just for clarification, that completes public comment for items on the agenda. Correct. And we will hear any comments um, not on the, uh, on the agenda at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Next, moving on to discussion. Item number two, fiscal year 2023 to 24 mid-year budget report. Staff? Mayor, the next item on the agenda is the city manager update. Thank you. It's okay. City manager's update. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. We have our city manager update of things going on in the city to present to you. Uh, first, some good news from Washington, D.C. Uh, the city has learned that it, has, uh, it will be receiving over $1.8 million from the federal bed, uh, budget that was signed last week. Uh, we received two awards, like as I said, totaling over $1.8 million, uh, and the funds were among the community project funding requests that were submitted by Congressman Pete Aguilar for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. $950,000 will help fund high-definition uh, high security cameras in downtown San Bernardino, and $863,000 will help fund a new community center at Nicholson Park. Great news, great news. Yes.
Yesterday, the day was for the dogs. Uh, we had our new animal, mobile animal clinic uh, debuted and was launched uh, at uh, Second Lake Park. Uh, the ribbon cutting in, co in coordination with San Manuel Band of Mission Indians uh, both uh, was a chance to celebrate as well as provide free microchipping and vaccinations for local dogs. Uh, everybody had a wonderful time, perfect weather. This was a rescheduled event. And this gives us the opportunity to take vaccinations and take microchipping around the city rather than require people to either find a veterinarian or come to the Animal Services Center uh, over on Chandler Place. So another great, great event that happened yesterday. Uh, if you saw the Academy Awards a week and a half ago, you probably heard Oppenheimer a lot of times. Uh, and we had a low, there was a local connection to Oppenheimer. The uh, Academy Award winning score uh, to Oppenheimer, uh, which was composed by Ludwig Göransson, Göransson actually, if I can pronounce it correctly, uh, was the score was actually conducted by the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra director, Anthony Parthner. Uh, uh, so if you see uh, the maestro, be sure to congratulate him for his work. Uh, although Ludwig uh, receives the trophy, uh, uh, the maestro was the, uh, the baton behind the music uh, for, uh, for Oppenheimer. So congratulations in that local tie to the Academy Awards. Uh, also, if you were not aware, last night the Cal State San Bernardino Coyotes men's basketball team defeated Azusa Pacific to win the NCAA Division II Western Regional and advance to the Elite Eight. Uh, the six-seeded Yotes will play Evans in Evansville, Indiana next Tuesday with the winner to reach the Division II Final Four. So congratulations to Cal State San Bernardino. <laughs> this Saturday, we are holding an egg extravaganza at Fiscalini Field. And this is one of those days for the kids, anyone between 1 and 12 will have an opportunity to go on an Easter egg hunt, meet the bunny, play games, do arts and crafts. And it is such a wonderful event. You've never seen kids have a better time. But the shout out for this goes to park staff and their volunteers who stuffed 30,000 Easter eggs to make the day so special for our kids. So if you're around Fiscalini Field uh, by Paris Hill Park on Saturday between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., please stop by. Bring your kids, and it's just a wonderful time to celebrate. And uh, I believe the weather will be cooperating with us. A couple comings and goings. Uh, sitting right behind me to my right, or actually almost directly right behind me, uh, longtime civic leader Gabriel Elliott has joined the city of San Bernardino as the new director of community development and housing. Uh, 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 Gabriel brings over 30 years of public, comment, uh, public community development and planning experience, most recently serving as the Director of Planning for Calaveras County. Uh, and with the recently reorganized Community Development and Housing Department includes planning, building and safety, code enforcement and housing and homelessness. So welcome to the City of San Bernardino, G Gabriel. And although Charles mentioned it a little bit earlier, we, we have to, we've got the sad news that uh, Assistant City Manager Eddie Eveland will be leaving us after uh, a lengthy service as our Assistant City Manager and before that Human, uh, uh, human Resources Director. Uh, if you've worked with her behind the scenes because she's not always out in front of center, her calmness, her dedication to the city, she never panics in a crisis, is always looking for what's best for San Bernardino, and just that even-handed steadiness will be missed by us. Uh, you know, we, we wish her the, the best. Uh, she's relocating out of the area to, to, to be you know, close, closer to a, a family, and uh, it's just a huge loss for the city, and, and those are very big shoes to fill. So, Eddie, thank you for everything that you've done, and we'll miss you. And, And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now we will go into discussion. Right, Eddie? Item number two, um, fiscal year 2023-24 mid-year budget report. Staff? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Barbara Whitehorn and Zoeva Ruiz will be uh, 
bringing forward the mid-year report with some good news and some excellent recommendations for your consideration. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of Council. I'm Barbara Whitehorn, Director of Finance and Management Services, and to my right is Zueva Ruiz, our Budget Division Manager. Um, our presentation overview, I'll give a brief economic update um, and then a review of revenues, um, budget performance to date, um, necessary budget amendments, and Zueva will go over our city manager's recommendations for additional um, budget amendments and then a discussion of our uh, impacts on the budget and our forecasts for the end of the year um, will come back to me. So looking at an economic update um, for a current, you know, what's going on economically, nationally, and locally, um, we're seeing an, it nationally, fourth quarter of 2023, GDP growth, gross domestic product, of about 3.3%, which exceeded expectations of economists. Personal income nationwide has increased by almost $225 billion, and disposable personal income has increased. Personal savings was um, $800 almost $20 billion, which is down from $850 billion in quarter three, which is not necessarily a bad thing. What that means is people are spending their savings. That usually happens a little bit in the fourth quarter. I can't imagine why. Um, but that actually does mean that people are spending some of that savings that they built up during the COVID times. Um, local economic trends, um, San Bernardino County unemployment rate, um, I actually edited this because we have the January numbers now. Um, January 2024 is up um, over a year ago. Um, these are preliminary numbers in January. December and January are both preliminary still. 5.5% um, unemployment um, in San Bernardino County up from 4.4% in 23. These numbers are still fairly okay. I mean, I, you know, we don't really like to see them at 5% or higher, but of course, you know, nationally that's not bad. Um, that's about where California sits, so it's not a bad number, but of course none of us want to see unemployment increasing. Um, the CPI, Consumer Price Index, was unchanged from October to November. Um, and details, it has increased over the last 12 months. Food prices continue to go up, which of course is hitting everyone, particularly people in lower income areas. The energy index has decreased overall, but and gasoline prices are down, but electricity is up. So that kind of balances out for households, right? You know, if electricity is increasing and gas is going down, if you have a commute, yay, but you're still paying more to heat your house if you have um, electric heating or, you know, just turning the lights on, it's, that's not great. So it ends up being sort of an overall increasing cost of living in the area. So revenue review for the city. Um, everything is coming in approximately on budget. Um, some of our revenues are down just a little bit. Sales and use tax is a little bit lower than we anticipated, just a tiny, tiny bit. And Measure S, which is that transaction and use tax, that's a tiny bit lower than anticipated. But our utility user tax, which is the tax on like electricity, on gas, on those um, utilities, obviously, that's higher than anticipated because those fuels are costing more right now. So that tax is higher. That's been coming down over the last few years by like a quarter of a percent every year. So seeing that increase has been surprising, but that is because of those high fuel costs. And that's offsetting those slight decreases in the other taxes. And we're also seeing other um, areas of uh, revenues slightly higher than anticipated licenses and permits, franchise taxes, and miscellaneous revenue, which is stuff that we don't really anticipate year over year. And our forecast revenue is higher than our budget. So revenue performance, this is just details on those. 
and underperforming are the Measure S sales and use cannabis tax, um, and then over budget are licenses and permits, utility user tax, and franchise tax. So budget performance by departments. Um, most of the departments are performing essentially on budget. And key to note when you're looking at those individually is that we pay the California um, pension for all of our employees annually in July. And as you know, that's a large payment. We pay $23.2 million for our safety employees. And that hits the police department budget in July. So that makes the police budget look like they've spent an enormous portion of their budget, like right away. It looks like they're at 56% in December. They're not. 23 million of that 66 million is actually that big CalPERS payment. So if you take that out, they're actually nowhere near their, their, that amount. They're at like 46% of budget, which is pretty much dead on where we would want them to be at 50% of the fiscal year. And then miscellaneous, which is the rest of the employees that are not sworn safety employees, is a $9.6 million payment. So that doesn't have nearly the impact on all of those department budgets when you spread it out all, uh, you know, across those budgets. And departments that are on track or under budget are all of these listed police, community development, city manager's office, finance. I won't read them all to you. And then we have some necessary budget amendments to stay on track for the year. And that includes legal services for outside, outside specialized legal counsel. That's not the services that BB&K, you know, daily provides for the city, like Sonia's work and the normal day-to-day -day reviewing of contracts, that kind of service. But these, these are the services for outside legal in regard to, like, the city being sued or, you know, those kind of services. And this is... Um, an expense that we consider likely to be ongoing, at least until we settle some of the lawsuits um, that exist right now. Some of those, we don't anticipate some of those to be ongoing. However, until those are settled, we wanna keep that million dollars sort of available. Police department, there's also an $875,000 for additional overtime, but that is fully reimbursable. So that's not a, like 875 increase only in expenditures, that's also in revenue. Um, other funds, this is what they look like right now. They're about where they should be. The only one that is extremely over budget is liability insurance, and that is for settlements. Same deal as that increase in legal costs. That's for settlements that were not anticipated, but we made a lot of settlements, which is a good thing. We settled lawsuits that have been outstanding for a while in the beginning of this fiscal year. And those, of course, have come to you all in closed session for your approval to settle those. So while you're familiar with those, that probably looks like Holy cow, 84% at 50% of the fiscal year, which is, you know, kind of like, oh my gosh, that's a lot. But that's really a good thing. That means we're settling lawsuits that have been hanging over our heads for a while. So we're taking care of those and getting them out of the way. However, to make sure that that fund doesn't go over budget, we need to amend it at this point to make sure that we're, you know, in a good place for the rest of the year. So budget performance, on track or under budget, animal services, fleet services, and information technology. And then the liability fund requires another $7 million to ensure that we can stay on track and settle any additional, um, any additional um, lawsuits that we have coming up. And that's, again, due to higher than anticipated settlements in the first half of the year. Okay, let's see. And now I'm going to turn it over to Zuiva for the city manager's recommendations. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. So um, looking at the budget performance, we've also uh, worked in collaboration with the city manager's office. And so um, identifying some critical needs within the city. Um, the city manager has uh, 
identified um, some challenges that the Community Development and Housing Department is currently experiencing. So uh, currently we depend on um, some contracted services for uh, building inspections and just the building um, division in general and right now the labor market is proving to be extremely difficult in recruiting for those positions um, but in order to continue to provide those services and bring those services in-house and lessen our dependency on the contracted staff uh, we uh, the city manager is requesting an additional full-time building inspector position within the community development and housing department For a library, um, currently there is a lack of management support for the director. We know Ed definitely holds it down in the library department to provide services for the community. There's been some difficulty recruiting and keeping personnel in the library department in order to be able to address uh, that support that the director needs specifically, as well as um, continuing to allow for the library hours to continue to expand and provide services to the community. Um, city manager is requesting a full-time management analyst position to support the director and a full-time library technician position in order to support the branch library. For parks and recreation, uh, currently there's some renovations uh, happening at Roosevelt Bowl. And as we know, we host uh, several events at Roosevelt Bowl. And there's also a few um, services that we like to provide to the community. And with that is the senior services that we provide. With these challenges that were identified, the city manager is requesting a stage trailer to be a one-time purchase of 125,000. This is in order to continue allowing the events that happen at Roosevelt Bowl while those renov renovations are occurring. Uh, the stage trailer would help take place of those events to make sure that the community can continue to be involved in the wonderful events that Parks hosts. And uh, in order to also support the senior services, um, there's a recommendation of a full-time community recreation program supervisor. This is specific to uh, the senior nutrition division. In police, um, so PD actually continues to do a great job at applying and receiving grants. Um, but with that comes uh, a lot of reporting requirements and in order for us to adhere and uh, track those grants properly. Uh, there's some um, manual processes that are currently in place uh, for the tracking of personnel costs. So as we continue to get that grant funding and um, absorb some of that grant funded personnel, there the city manager has identified that an accounting technician position is also needed in order to assist in some of the payroll functions and some of the reporting requirements for the grants, as well as the social media or community engagement team. This was previously grant funded. Uh, the grant fund has come to term, and so the city manager is recommending that this be fully funded through uh, general fund. So that's a full-time marketing and public relations position and a criminal investigation officer position. There is also some state mandated <clears throat> crime statistics reporting and there is currently a lack of civilian personnel within the uh, police department in order to support that sta state mandated statistics reporting. So in order to support that, the city manager is requesting a full-time police record supervisor and three full-time police record technicians in order to make sure we're adhering to the, uh, the mandates set forth. This is a summary of the uh, recommended amendments to the budget. So um, in, for general funds specifically, it's 2.3 million that is being requested and liability is the 7 million that Barbara spoke about. And this is also a summary. So this breaks it down by the ongoing costs and the one-time costs. So the city manager recommendation is 11 full-time positions. The impact for the year anticipating um, a higher date throughout the year, it's prorated. So for 20, fiscal year 24, the impact would be 300 and, 
give or take 363,000. Ongoing cost is approximately a million. For the specialized legal, uh, the current amendment would be 1 million and ongoing would be 1 million. So for fiscal year 23-24, the total ongoing is 1.4 million and um, total ongoing moving forward would be approximately 2 million. For the one-time costs, we spoke about the police overtime. This is fully reimbursable, but this is 875,000. The park stage trailer would be one time, which is 125,000, and the liability fund is 7 million one time. Total fiscal year 24 impact is an amendment of 8 million, and the budget impact moving forward would be 7 million. And I will turn it back over to Barbara. All right, so to discuss the um, actual impact on the budget and the um, forecast for the year, um, the amended general fund expenditures before mid-year were about 214 million. Um, with the mid-year amendments, the amended budget would be 216 million 367,715. Um, with estimated year end, once we look at, you know, where we anticipate everyone's budget to wind up, about 206.7 million. So the internal service and other funds, um, the amended budget was about 39 million. Our mid-year um, recommendation is to add that $7 million to the uh, liability fund, which would bring the total amended budget to about $45.9 million. Um, estimated year-end would be about $45.9 million. Those funds are anticipated to spend all of their budget. And I made some changes to this slide from what you have in your packet because I felt like this would give you a better idea of how the end of the year actually looks. Um, because the amended budget with revenue and expenditures didn't really show you the forecast well. Um, and I wanted you to really understand where the forecast would be. Um, and in the yellow, what I did was I added what would be our forecast revenue in the yellow. Because while that 10 million in the mid-year additions isn't something that we're adding, like amending the budget with, when we're forecasting revenue, we're looking at where do we think revenue is going to wind up? And we're not amending revenue for that forecast, but we do anticipate that our our revenue will end at about 218.4 million. So, and expenditures will end at about 206.7. So by the end of the year, we believe we will contribute to fund balance about 11.66 million. So even with these amendments to the budget, we anticipate adding 11.7 million to fund balance. So we are still in a really good financial place with these additions. Um, and I want to make that really clear because I know coming in and saying, we think we should add these things, when I've just said, we're seeing a little bit lower than anticipated revenue and sales tax, um, it always sounds a little concerning. And I do want to make clear that we're still seeing significant savings. We're still seeing significant increases in revenue. And we are also seeing economically you know, last year we had economists saying, we think a recession is coming. We still think a recession is coming. And the number, the number of economists saying that has gone from like 90% to 70% to 50%. And now it's less than 15% of economists saying that they believe there's a recession coming. They now say, no, there's not. Um, the Fed now is signaling that they're gonna start bringing rates down again which means that you know, instead of fighting inflation, they've now said inflation is, is, has stopped and they can start lowering rates again, which means hopefully that people will feel comfortable taking out home loans again. We can start seeing that sector improve. So I think in general, the economy is gonna settle down a little and we can see people start spending again. Which is, which is good. And I think the first indicator we had of that was really that 
savings number in the last quarter starting to decrease. We do see that a little bit in the fourth quarter always, but not to the extent that we did um, in that economic report I gave you. So I think this was an important bottom line to really highlight that we know we're going to contribute at a minimum $11 million to our fund balance at the end of the year. So with that, I want to turn it over to you all for questions and discussion. Thank you. I have two council members who want to speak. Madam City Clerk, can you see the member, uh, city council members? I cannot see their names. I do see two, three now. Number four. Now there's four council members, but I don't see their names. So, uh, Madam City Clerk, do you see, can you call out the name of the council members who? I just, yes. I would like for those who put in their request first. Councilmember Alexander. Followed by. Councilmember Reynoso, followed by Councilmember Ibarra and Councilmember Sanchez. Thank you. I see it now. <laughs> Councilmember Alexander. Oh, well, thank you. I was waiting for on you, Mayor, to be recognized. All right, thank you for your report. I appreciate it. Um, one thing I always ask is, how are we doing with the cannabis, um, and why is it not a little higher? I believe that it is the intent of community development to bring a report on cannabis and where we are on that. Um, I can't speak to it um, with any level of expertise, or I would. I know that we are underperforming budget, um, in part because we have at least one that has not paid their cannabis tax in several years, and we have shut them down, but I can't give you a very thorough response other than that. But I know there is an intent to bring a report to you, and perhaps Susie or Eddie can give a better response to that. We will work with Mr. Elliott to determine a timeline of when that report will come back. I do know that there has been some lag in the collections of those taxes, and that's it's reflected in your budget. That was the answer we got last time. So what, what has changed? Because that's the answer you gave us last time. That's the reason why. But you gave us this answer Six ago. right a, a while ago. So I would expect that you guys would come up with an answer if you gave us this answer so four Barbara, or five months ago. So, Barbara, why don't you ago. go through what the collections process looks like? From a business registration standpoint, where the money is actually collected, all they can do is send it to collections, which they do, and they can pursue pulling a business license or pulling a cannabis license in concert with um, the cannabis license people in community development. Now, with one particular license holder, they did take that and they worked with the state to shut down the business because they hadn't paid in two years. Um, so we, we did do that. Um, however, we have, other, we have another business now that is also not paying. So it's not, it is an extremely challenging process because each business has three licenses. They have one with the state to obtain legal cannabis product, they have one with the state to sell cannabis product, and they actually they have four licenses, I'm sorry I misspoke, then they have one with the city to sell cannabis, and they have one with the city to operate a business. So the business that we shut down lost their operational license with the city, their cannabis license with the city, and their license with the state to sell cannabis. However, they still hold a license with the state to purchase legal cannabis product. And, and that is possibly causing some problems because they can still purchase legal cannabis product. So they still have a building 
full of legal cannabis product. And, uh, and, we, and I appreciate that, but I guess the public, and, well, and we and wanted to know, you know, this was supposed to be the quote unquote revenue generator of all revenue generators. And now that we've lost two um, licensees, we still haven't seen the revenue that was forecasted to us yet. And, and that I understand. And so we have another business now that isn't paying their taxes. So we're pursuing them through collections. And, you know, as far as getting other licensees up and running, I can't speak to how quickly that happens mm -hmm. because that is not within my purview. Okay. I understand. I'm just, yeah. you have a quick question? Somebody have a quick it's question? A safe, it's a, it's I have more, but I, go ahead. Do you want to go ahead? Oh. Ask. You have a quick question, council member? Yeah, you, uh, I mean, I'll just come back. I'll come, I'll come back. No, I'm, no, I'm not. Oh, oh, okay. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, th and this city manager's uh, report, well, let me just back up. We approved uh, Mr. McNeely's uh, strategic plan, council's strategic plan. How does this blend into this strategic plan? Because I don't, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. So how does it, how does that work? Remember the yes. strategic plan that we that the council approved. So how does that work within this recommendation here? Mayor and uh, Council Member Alexander, I I can answer that. So if you recall, when we brought forward the strategic initiatives, there was a workshop followed by a special meeting mm -hmm. where there was funding that was allocated to those strategic initiatives. This item is separate and distinct from the strategic initiatives. So if the question is a status update on what was approved and the funding that was allocated for the various initiatives that's outside of this item. So none of these none of these items in here were in that initial strategic initiative plan plan that we approved because it looks like some of it are the same. Do you, it doesn't the off the top issues? off the top it does not appear to me that um, there's any duplicate items. But don't they apply to the budget still? Yes, yeah, so the budget um, would have been amended at the time that you adopted it. It was right around September or October. So we had brought forward, remember, the workshop, and then we brought forward the funding. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you approved the funding, and the budget was amended at that time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Reynoso? I have a few questions. Some are related to what you were just talking about. Um, this one is more so for Parks and Recreation. I want to know if there's certain things that have been allocated or I guess that we're forecasting. I know we need more portable lights. I know we need park lights. That's definitely with Public Works too. Um, Spiker Skate Park on the east side. People are reaming me about that. I'm not even their direct council member, but they know I stand with the skaters. Um, so I want to know about the portable lights, park lights, skate park lights, um, Spiker Skate Park. If, that, if any of that is in this? Yes and no. So the portable lights and any of the lights throughout any of our parks will be part of our master plan findings. So we can put a CIP plan together and prioritize that according to our findings and the audit of all of our facilities, parks, and amenities. And the skate park is already budgeted and is planning to have shovels in the ground by July, August. Okay. Before, before you leave, i got one more for you. Okay. Um, the, the park rangers, that's why I was saying it was related. Have we flown that? Has that died? Did it go away with Charles McNeely? That was part of the Charles McNeely plan, and it was moved from parks to PD. And uh, Adam. Would you like to step up, Chief? Just if we've flown the positions at all, is there any intent to bring the park rangers? Uh, yes, there is an intent. Uh, the positions specifically have not been flown, uh, but the intent is to move forward towards that. Is there a timeline for that? Uh, no. Is there anything that's holding that back or just not priority? Well, it is a priority, but the timeline in terms of when the positions will be flown uh, is based on exactly when we get the budget for it. I know that, that it's being talked about, but we don't have the 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 correct the, the approval for it yet. At least that, that's not been given to us. So Eddie, that's not in this? 
I know it's not in this one particularly. Is it allocated the amount of money that we would need potentially for the position? Is that in our budget? It might not be sitting in the PD's budget, but the strategic initiatives did incorporate park Funding. rangers. There was a certain, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't, it was like a graduated plan over time where we would augment in future years, but there was a small allocation for park rangers as part of the strategic initiatives. We have the HR director here uh, that can speak to the recruitment. The oh, park nice. ranger has been um, flown. We did recruit for that. It opened, I believe, in December um, and closed in December. So we are working through those candidates. They have to go through the background process and everything, but we did fly that. The supervisor were waiting until the park rangers are done. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and one more question. Um, this is related. I didn't know that, um, thank you, Chief, that uh, the social media, whoever's running social media for the police department is exceptional. I didn't know it was grant funded. Um, so totally in favor of that, but I want to take a play out of their book because I think that Jeff could use a film crew and whatever's going right in PD, like mimic that for the city. I see some of our economic development and our businesses being highlighted, but it's 2024. And so trying to help you out, Jeff, um, you know, make you a film producer so you can drop the next Oppenheimer. Um, but that's pretty much, yeah, but I want to be specific on the record. Um, I understand my role here. So when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about, because I have some film experience sitting as a film crew, editors, take it what you will. I want to say this. I know, IMG. They have a lot on their plate. Clearly, we have a lot of people who do a lot of things here that are stretched extremely thin, and we understand that. I understand that. Um, Sydney's so a film crew, editors, and a social media specialist, um, and using PD as the model. I wanted to say that on the record because everything we do is on the record. I don't want to have people wondering what I was talking about. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ibarra. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Barbara, for the presentation. Um, I wanted to start off on page nine, the 23-24 uh, revenue report that was provided to us. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it is for 23-24, not 24-25. Yes. Okay, yeah, because I'm looking at this report and it's showing me that we are we uh, we adopted a very high budget back then, and I I I would have liked to seen I would have liked to have seen actual numbers, not adopted and amended numbers, as final ones. Um, if if that's the amended budget, I just wanted to make sure that, that this is the amended budget. It's the final numbers for twenty three twenty four. Is that correct? And like. Uh, the adopted budget, the amended budget, and the forecast? What are you asking? And the, well, I was looking at the estimated too, but, but I was trying to focus on how the report was prepared for us for 23, 24, and then the year to date. So in looking at those numbers, it's showing me that we are not bringing in the revenue that we did back then. Oh, you mean that you would expect to see 50% year to date? That's, that's because sales tax is approximately, sales and transaction and use tax are approximately 50% of our revenue, and they're received two months in arrears. So they're received two months after the fact. So if we've received, if it's six months through the year, we've only received four months of sales tax. So we, we can't actually have received 50% of sales tax at this point. We've only received like 33%. Correct, and that's, that's what's concerning to me. Well, you know? we won't have received 50% of sales tax until February, and we won't have received 12 months of sales tax in, in June. We won't receive June sales tax until August. So every fiscal year is two months behind on sales tax. So the, uh, the numbers you have, the year to date, December 31 uh, numbers, those are the final ones through December. You don't have through the end of February being that it's March now. We, every year is like that. And that's always, and that's, that's always the way it is because we always receive tail, sales tax two months in arrears. Like if you pay sales tax today, the state gets it next month and they give it to us the following month. So the way that we look at sales tax and forecast it is we look at it how does this year compare to last year, compared to the year before, compared to the year before that? 
And that's the only way that we can really look at it because if we, if we try to do it like, oh, does, does six months look like six months, it never can because of the way it's collected and dispersed by the state because it's two months in arrears. Okay, but, and, and, but you do anticipate we're gonna make up that difference then? Easily. Okay, just wanna make sure, because it concerns me, because if we're gonna approve a budget that, you know, it's showing smaller numbers than what we're actually thinking yeah. we're gonna bring in, and it, it, that money doesn't come in, it, we're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, this is an every year thing, and we always, we always get those final sales tax numbers two months after the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other questions, I, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Elliott, for joining our team in our city. We were waiting <laughs> for director because we're trying to build the economic development department as well, and that's going to help our city. And now, with that said, I, I keep getting complaints, just so you know, about the permitting process in our city. It's way too slow. We're losing businesses to other cities for that same reason. Um, so, you know, come May, June, if you want to request additional permit processors, I gladly accept, uh, will adopt those to come in uh, because we do need the staffing. Um, the biggest concern I've always voiced is that we're top heavy and we don't have actual people at the counters assisting the public and processing. And as you heard right now, uh, we are behind on collecting uh, from other, you know, the, the cannabis businesses that are closing, they're not paying their taxes to our city. So. Um, let's look into how we can bring in that revenue into our city. You have a big job ahead of you, <laughs> waiting for you. Um, the, for the parks, I know we had received a, a grant from our federal government for Roseville Bowl, and we are here spending 125000 for a one-time trailer. Can we talk about where we are with that funding that we mm -hmm. received? and why we're purchasing a trailer. The trailer and the Roosevelt Bowl are two separate entities. Uh, the funding for the Roosevelt Bowl was to fix the Roosevelt Bowl priorities being the ADA access, the stage, the lighting, and the surrounding areas, including the fencing. Um, and that was the 1.4, yeah, 1.4 million. Uh, the stage trailer is actually for us to substitute the stage of the Roosevelt Bowl when it is under construction, but also to use it for all of our events. So to give you an idea, for the upcoming festival event, we have over $30,000 going towards just stage rentals and equipment rentals. This is a trailer that can be rolled out on our trucks and be brought to any of our parks, any of our events. It can also be used as a rentable item for school districts if they want to have a block party or any type of concert or show events or, God forbid, any major emergency. It's a place where our PIO can speak as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to clarify that part. Thank you. Um, so we got the permit processors. We talked about the parks. Um, and I think those were all my questions for what was presented to us here today. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Council reports. Member. Council Member Calvin. <coughs> I'm sorry, Sanchez. Followed, then followed by Calvin. Okay, so you're going to see a, a kind of a running theme here. Um, so I like all the uh, budget amendments that are being presented by staff, and I will be voting to approve those. Uh, but there are a couple things missing. Uh, I'll go ahead and start off with our Parks Department. So uh, <clears throat> our Parks Department has more assets now uh, than it has had for the last five years since I've been here. Uh, there are parks like Seccom Lake where we hosted a beautiful event yesterday that was a park that we had no footprint in because it was too dangerous to go to. Um, it's a place now um, where people can go. Uh, the city needs to be able to provide programming for parks like that. Uh, we have uh, Nicholson Park that's coming online. Uh, we have pools uh, that don't have the, st that, that are, that are, that are um, in a condition to have swimmers and, and recreation, but we don't have the staffing. Um, and so, uh, the bandwidth of the award-winning parks department uh, is only as wide uh, as its staffing. And the fact that uh, the assets have grown significantly, uh, we need to be able to provide for um, program coordination. Um, so I want to add, uh, I will, uh, my motion will be to direct staff to include two additional program coordinators in our award-winning parks department 
as part of the uh, mid-year budget amendment. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, uh, I had an incident happen recently, uh, several actually. Uh, there was both a car crash with no injury and a business uh, that was broken into. Um, because uh, in most cases we don't have enough of those non-sworn report takers, for lack of a better term, I don't know what they're called, um, they had to wait for police to show up. And, and police and dispatch was encouraging them to submit their, um, their complaints online. And uh, their complaints online. And it's just not the same. Um, people are frazzled after a car crash, even if they're not injured. They would much prefer to see someone show up with the city seal, um, taking down the report, and making sure that they're thoroughly taken care of before they leave um, the scene of the the scene of the crime, uh, or or the scene of the incident. In this case, uh, I think it's a win-win when we're able to get non-sworn civilian staff in a city shirt, uh, professionals who can take down these reports. Uh, make sure that the individual in our city, whether it's a business owner, a resident, or a motorist, is taken care of, and then we, and then we move, <laughs> and then we move on. Um, and we can do it at half the cost. We can do it at half the cost with uh, non-sworn uh, police personnel. Uh, so I want to ask for, and this is another one that I want to direct staff to add three non-sworn, and I don't know what they're called. I think CSOs. Three, uh, three CSOs to the budget amendment. Add three of those, um, because if you're ever caught in one of those situations, you're gonna want someone to show up, be able to put their hand on, on your shoulder and say, it's okay, I'm here to take down the report, we're gonna take care of it. Uh, thirdly, uh, along with the customer service oriented amendments that I'm proposing, uh, we only have two council office staffers. Uh, the seven of us here get a million calls between the seven of us um, uh, with constituent concerns. And right now we only have really uh, two council staffers. When I came on board, we had four, we had four uh, and we are now down to two. Um, and I want to make sure that from nine to five, Monday through Friday, someone always answers that phone because I hand out that number all the time and I want to make sure that it doesn't go to voicemail. We have to make sure that we, uh, we are there to respond and give that human touch. Just like with the CSOs, just like with the program coordinators at the park, we need people to answer the call and feel like they're heard. Um, constituents, at least with me, have in the past sometimes called in tears because of concerns they have. And, we're, and people like Cheryl and Sheena are able to settle them down uh, and get them taken care of. But right now, with two of them taking care of seven council members, it's really difficult. And I knew we had to cut them back five years ago. We had to make a lot of cuts. Um, City Hall was almost empty. Uh, but now we have the ability to, to increase our bandwidth to provide customer service to the residents we are here to serve. Uh, so I want to add an additional, per, uh, an, addi an additional person in the council office, uh, and with three people there, we need to make sure that we can budget for a reclassification, because now with three individuals, we do need uh, a mid-level manager to manage that council staff. So uh, I'm sure HR can find out what it would cost for an additional council staffer, um, as well as, uh, as well as the necessary budget uh, to make sure that we uh, reclassify uh, one of the personnel to, to fulfill a management role. Uh, how many is that? Is that three or four? I knew I had four. Is that four? It was, it was three and a reclassification, so a total of four actions. So police, parks, I had them written down somewhere and then I lose it. Uh, police, parks, council office. Oh, yeah, yeah, and last one. Um, uh, sometimes um, we have frivolous uh, requests um, for public records, I think, but regardless of whether they're frivolous or not, we are held 
to a federally mandated standard. Um, and we do not have enough people fulfilling the PRA requests, making sure that all the records are in uh, decent shape. And so I am requesting that we add a record technician, um, uh, I, think a I think it would be a record te technician that would handle PRA requests um, as well as record keeping. Um, we get the emails asking us for every email and phone call that's been sent over the last 12 months. Um, and so those would be my four requests for additional budget amendments. Um, and to remind uh, the, the viewing audience out there and my colleagues, we have right now a, essentially an $11.7 million surplus. And everything I am asking for right now increases our ability to serve the people that are paying the taxes that feed into our revenue. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues will see these amendments as something that is our responsibility as our revenues continue to increase. So that is uh, my motion. Mayor. Yes. And uh, Council Member Sanchez. Yes. Um, staff doesn't disagree with you that there are additional resources that are needed throughout the city, but we would appreciate an opportunity to take back what your recommendations are and work with the directors to identify the, the level position that would meet the council's direction. No, the, the problem is that then this goes through, uh, if for the people out there, and I'll give you a little 101, um, department heads make their proposals to the city manager's office. City manager says, yes to this, no to that, yes to this, no to that. Uh, we give direction to the city manager. We see this as a priority. So regardless of what the department heads want, um, we see what our constituents out there need, and this is what they need right now. And so you go ahead and bring this forward. Staff can go ahead. I mean, you gave this wonderful explanation at the last council meeting. You can go ahead and present what I just proposed right now, and as, as the assistant city manager or city manager or department head, you can say, Theodore, I know you made this recommendation to increase my department, but I will have to recommend, and I'm asking you, do not make this amendment. Do not give me that extra money for my department for this or that. You can make that recommendation, but at the end of the day, it's up to these seven council members to decide that. So I want those budget amendments brought back, and you can go ahead at that time, make a recommendation that no, we do not recommend you do this, but council, you decide yes or no. So that I want that brought back um, uh, I want that brought uh, I want that brought back. We're what second meeting in March um, second meeting in April That's second. very feasible. Okay, yes. good. You bring those forward and at that point yes, department absolutely. heads and you and Montoya can opine and say no, we don't recommend this and at that point we can decide whether we move forward with those budget amendments or not. Thank you, Madam City Attorney, did you wanna? Okay, thank you. Uh, next uh, council member is council member Calvin. Thank you, Mayor. So um, Director Whitehorn, I really appreciate your report. Um, and I'm gonna then definitely circle back to the cannabis because that is the issue in um, Madam Assistant City, uh, City Manager that we have seemed to be discussing for the past two years. That City of San Bernardino, I believe now, is sending out a message that we do not have any control over the way that we um, recuperate uh, the funds that are owed uh, to the City of San Bernardino. And um, it appears that that is just a trend now and uh, that is one that we need to stop because issuing those cannabis licenses uh, was a means to um, inflate our budget. It was definitely things that we would be able to utilize those funds to help other areas in our city and we just simply are not doing that. So wherever the pitfalls are or the gaps in these systems are, we need to figure out how to close those because it really is not 
is satisfactory for us to continue to be told the same thing over and over again. And um, it's, it's just sending out a bad message for us. And we need those funds um, to be able to do other things in this city that we need to do. So if you would just please, um, matter of fact, uh, business department, right, is who is over the 17 licenses, or is it now? Did I hear you say we were tracked to 15? Who's over, who's over the cannabis licensing? No, that's the community development department. So, and community development is responsible for collecting those funds as well? The collections are in business registration, but the licenses and issuing the licenses, that's, actually, I think it's economic development now. Okay, so, Mr. Elliot, <laughs> seems like you already have a huge task on your hands before you, sir. Um, but uh, the collection of those, we can't lay that all on Mr. Elliot. We seem that there seems to be a problem. So before he takes over, or maybe he's going to be assisting us in um, finding out where the problem is. Uh, again, it's just totally unsatisf unsatisfactory for us to be discussing this issue uh, continuously. Um, I would like to have a full breakdown then when we go talk about uh, the million dollars that's needed immediately um, for uh, legal. How much money are we currently spending with BBK? The current budget for legal is um, 4.3 million. Um, the estimate, the estimate for the year end is 5.3, and that's about what we anticipate for next year as well. Um, the their internal uh, portion of that is how much, Zuiva? About BB and K retainer is what? I'm sorry, I can't. I don't know that off the top of my head. Maybe, maybe Sonia does. I'm so gonna have can, to get yeah. back to you. How much money that we're paying her? That should come yeah. from the finance I'll have department. To tell you at the that's next that's meeting. okay. Then fine. So you can sorry. then report that back to me. Mayor, uh, also, woman Calvin, if I may. So the million dollar budget amendment is not for, is not for the BBK uh, retention. Okay. It's for outside, specialized outside legal counsel that's okay. defending city okay. lawsuits, you know, in court litigation. Council that Member can... Sanchez, I question you and I recommend that you will not speak at this particular time because, sir, you do not want me to respond to you at all. Council Member. The lawsuits Please. are because of you. No, Council you do not want to respond to you. That's what you do not Please. want me to do. How many open contracts do we have with legal at this particular time? Um, I can come back to you with that, but I, I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that one. I'm concerned about the CIP, the 4% that we have to this date. Why is that so low? Only 4% of the budget has been utilized for capital improvement plan projects. Um, I would have to defer to Public Works so that okay. they could discuss exactly what's happening with various projects. Okay, if we could, please. Councilmember Calvin, basically the number that you're seeing up there is um, not an accurate number based on our actual CIP budget. That is actually a separate document that we're putting together. We have over 71 projects that we have been working on and completing, and that is uh, being prepared and been sent to finance as of today. So the actual number that we're doing, we are producing um, quite a few. Uh, we have Nicholson Park, as you, were, as you awarded in, March, in uh, December, that has come forward, that's $8 million that has been allocated. And that those additional funds, um, the additional CIP, are projects that you award on a regular basis that we bring forward to you. That may show actual expenditures. So when a contract is awarded for construction, while it is encumbered, the funding is encumbered, it may not be expended, and that may be what you're seeing in that number as well. Okay, I can understand that, but I think that my, my question is, is that 
we have had we have uh, some very old projects on the capital improvement plan of this, and I think that what you just mentioned was a new project that eight million eight point eight million was added in about a year and a year and a half ago. So my concern is that we're not utilizing we're not taking projects off of the capital improvement plan list and utilizing the budget that we have to remove them from from the list. Well, anything that we are working on, the, the typical process is about a two-year process. So when we get to the end of a project, we do do the notice of completion and final closeouts on it. Those projects should be coming off, and that's what we're working to clean up on the CIP right now. And we've established the order of which we're doing that? Yes, yes. That's actually, we've been working on it this week, um, getting that information put together for a special meeting. Uh, I believe that's in April, that'll bring to you the, the total picture of the CIP program. But I can tell you that we have completed about 71 projects, um, and we've got uh, about the same amount on new projects as well uh, coming forward. So that's really kind of maybe reflecting a different kind of accounting for us. Um, I would have to talk with the finance director to kind of clarify on that. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. So I have another item that I'd like to discuss, and that is park and recreation. It seems that we're only amending the budget. I believe it was, well, close to maybe maybe 200000 with the trailer and then with the one position. Um, but when we're talking about opening up new community centers, we definitely know that we're going to need to add additional staffing for that. And if I recall last year, um, there were a lot of some parks that we could not open due to no staffing as well. So are we including an additional, uh, additional funds in the budget so that we can make sure that all community centers are open? Because I also know that Encanto needs programming uh, as well, and we have all of these additional, um, additional funds that need to be going to different parks. Mayor, Council, Councilmember Calvin, um, First off, this is a mid-year budget presentation, so a lot of what you were asking, you know, we're currently evaluating. Uh, we've worked with many of the departments, including PD, who need additional officers. So what we're trying to do is finish off this year to get a good snapshot to start next year because there is going to be extra money, but we need to have that availability of where we're at on funds before we recommend more positions. I can't just add positions without knowing where we're at. And so... PDs ask for a number of positions, and they deserve them, and they need them. So do the parks. But I need to know where we're at on the bottom line first. Uh, so I just, okay, so you mentioned, why did you mention PD instead of public works or any other department? I'm a little, why did you do that? Because I can say PD, public works, or all the other departments. So all, all the other departments don't need the same thing? All the other departments have requested additional positions, correct. Exactly. But the ones that have been presented to you right now are the ones I think we can fund without doing any more severe impact to the budget. And that's what we're trying to do before we bring you a complete picture. So if we're planning on, if we're working on different projects currently, how will those projects, like Nicholson Park, like uh, it, the other items that uh, Park Recreation uh, Director has asked for, how will we continue to grow in that area if we do not... Uh, staff them. You can't open them if you don't staff them. So, the, so that has to be included in the budget. Councilmember Calvin, I don't disagree. No, no World Parks or anybody else up here will disagree with your statement. However, we also need to make sure those parks are up to par where some of the equipment and some of the playground equipment is not. And so we're trying to get the infrastructure in place, open up all the parks, and Eddie, uh, Lydia and I and everybody else has had the conversation, yes, they do need to expand programming for the youth in a bunch of different areas. But we're trying to get to a standpoint where we can start doing that and doing a hodgepodge at the time without trying to work through it. And that's why I'm, I've had every department evaluate what they need now and then come back so we know where we're going. So does the economic, uh, community economic development department need someone to go out and um, gather our funds from can for cannabis? Uh, Council Member Calvin, as far as the cannabis goes, we are not solicitors for the vendors, okay? They submit their licenses. If the state comes in and says, hey, we're going to shut them down because they didn't pay, then they're going to shut them down. That's not what I'm speaking about. I'm talking about does the business department, are, who is collecting our funds? That is our job. That is not the state's job. The city of San Bernardino needs to collect their own funds. Who's collecting our funds? The state. The state collects our funds. The state collects then, all our funds. So then what are we doing? What is, are, do, we need a, do we need an employee, that additional staff person, to be able to assist us to do that? Because for the last two and a half years, we have not been collecting our funds. So where does the problem lie? 
Councilmember Calvin, we do not need additional staffers at this time. We need to hire the positions that we currently have in place. That is the priority that we're trying to do right now. But that so brings in additional funding, correct? Bring hiring in more people? Recuperating our funds from taxes that are owned for over two years, is that not funds that the city could be utilizing at this moment? Uh, of course, absolutely, but you're missing the, the prime concept that I said to you before. If they're paying us and not paying the state, they're going to shut them down anyway, and there's nothing we can do. So if I could um, go back to council staff, I do think that the council staffing needs more staffing inside of their office. Uh, I do think that it is very unfair that that office does not get paid the amount of attention uh, that it needs to. So I would also like to ask that uh, we take a look at adding another council, another council staff person for us as well. Uh, you met, we mentioned, Mr. Uh, Council Member Alexander mentioned the strategic plan. Um, I would like to request that that plan be brought back to us so that we can identify what it is that we already pre-approved, should be in motion, um, and we have not seen anything back just yet. So I would like to update on the strategic plan. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Figueroa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director uh, Whitehorn, for the mid-year report. Um, I, I wanted to go back to something that you, I think um, you might have said, or maybe I misheard, more than likely I misheard earlier in the report, uh, that people are starting to spend more from their savings or, or adding more to their credit or increasing their credit, uh, credit card expenses, or what was that statement again? Um, that personal savings decreased in the fourth quarter of of calendar year 23, which actually is indicative of people starting to spend down the excess savings that they built up during COVID times. And that's sort of an indicator of consumer confidence starting to increase again. Because um, we saw um, people's savings go up a lot during COVID. Then it started to come down a little. Then when interest rates started to increase and people's confidence started decreasing in the economy, savings went up again. And that's usually an indicator when people are like, holy cow, things aren't looking so good, I'm going to start saving money again. So as we start to see consumer savings decrease again, just a little, you don't want to see it like way take a you know, nosedive, because that means then that people really um, don't have money and they're having to spend that's their savings. But when it decreases somewhat, that's a sign of consumer confidence increasing and people are spending their money. They're like, there's, I have enough money, I've, you know, making enough money in my job to make it so I can spend some of this savings that I've set aside. Okay. But, and but is their credit also like increasing, the, the credit line? Is yeah. It, because I interpret that as, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a concern because that's potential future collections and foreclosures. I know, foreclosures it, seems, it and seems like counterintuitive, like people aren't saving and it's not a good thing. But the savings levels over the last like 10 years have been higher in the United States than they've been historically, um, which has been really good because the United States savings rate has been much lower than in most of the world. And it's been like, dang, Americans, come on. Um, but now um, Americans have been saving, saving at a much higher rate. And seeing it come down just a little bit says people are a little more confident that they're in more secure jobs. They're, they're feeling more like the economy is, is safer. Um, so it's not that they're out there like putting a bunch of stuff on their credit cards, but that they feel more confident that they can buy a washing machine and they're not going to lose their job next week. And, and that savings that they spent, you know, 600 bucks on a washing machine, they're not going to be like, and now I don't have a job. Do you know what I mean? No, yeah. I do understand. I just want to make sure that we're confident to, to be able to move forward with this and not not be concerned with tightening the belt here because what, from what I heard, it sounds like we should be concerned. Yeah, but it's sometimes, sometimes economics um, seem counterintuitive, like, holy cow, like consumer savings is coming down. Shouldn't that be a worrisome sign? And it's actually the opposite. Okay. So, yeah. the, the other, the other, and I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold still here. Um, <clears throat> The other item that I wanted to address is to make sure that we have enough in the budget currently, because when, when I look later in the budget, uh, I, at least I presume that we're going to be inheriting uh, property, uh, do we have enough to be able to absorb the additional new costs with, with securing 
the, the property, the Harris building, the, um, the, you know, the, the boarding up or whatever additional costs might come with the inheritance of this building. Do we need to increase uh, for that in the budget or is there enough already in there? We don't need to increase at this time. We monitor the budget, and there's always a delta at the end okay. of the fiscal year. So okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was that was taken care of as well. Thank you. Yeah, Thank as, you, as Eddie said, and that delta is always like one time, and the Harris Building, of course, to improve that will be capital, and that's one time spending. So really that kind of um, historical building that the city would want to preserve would be one-time costs for the city rather than ongoing. Um, so it wouldn't be something that we would be paying for, you know, year after year after year. It would be expensive one-time costs, but it wouldn't be something that we would be paying for for 60 years. It would be something that we would pay for and then be done with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem Charette. Thank you. I was going to kind of say the same thing that the city manager said a few minutes ago, and that is that we tonight we're looking at a mid-year budget, and we should be, and I'm going to move that we approve what's been recommended. I know that all departments, there's never enough. There's never enough. And we can always use more people. Um, and so we need to be looking at those things, but they need to be evaluated, and we need to make sure that the revenues are there. Um, I'm going to respectfully disagree with some of the things that are being at least alluded to, and that is uh, some of the things I'm reading is that we're maybe uh, looking still at a recession in this in the in the country. Uh, there are certain there are certain economists that say that there's an 85 percent chance. I tend to disagree with that, but I I, I am concerned, and 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 I I get concerned when my saving goes down or when my credit card debt goes up, and I think that's what's happening. And of course it's the uh, um, we hear it all the time about eggs are no longer a dollar a dozen, they're $12 a dozen. <laughs> and, and they're not going down. Those prices uh, aren't, are not going down. And I don't hear of uh, interest rates coming down anytime soon from the Fed. Uh, they're always talking about it, uh, but I think maybe you and I listen to different uh, newscasts. Uh, so all I want to say is that tonight what we're looking at and we should be looking at recommendations from the staff that have given it good thought and, and talked to all department heads and they're asking for what they think they really need and I think we should be supporting that and the, the comments, concerns, questions, requests from my colleagues up here I think are all valid as well but they can be looked at and brought back and I, I agree with that completely. Um, whether or not we need two people in our office or three or four, I'm not prepared to determine that at this moment. But I am, I, I would ask that we take a good solid look at all those things. Um, we're still waiting for any, I know we've, uh, uh, Gabriel, I'm sorry, I'm going to go by first name. Uh, You've joined us and welcome aboard, and you're not the economic director, economic development director, so we're still looking for that, and we're going to be laying stuff on top of you, too, probably, that's probably outside of your uh, responsibility for housing and code and other things. So every the thing is, is that we've all got to be rowing in the same direction and working together uh, to 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 uh, to deal with these these issues and it's got to be done fiscally responsibly and we cannot just uh, start saying uh, well mid your budget let's ask for no n new people let's ask for uh, new equipment we want to supply uh, our we want to use our resources and give uh, the team the resources they need but they've got to be evaluated and they've got to be paid for and they've got to be we've got to have a revenue stream so um, I'm going to, my motion is that we go ahead and move uh, the, the staff's recommendation for tonight for the mid-year and then uh, staff will be taking into consideration all the concerns and questions and requests that we've had here tonight and they'll come back to us at an appropriate time in the future. So that's my motion. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. That was a recommendation for as is? Yes. Mm, could I, before uh, I would like. Could I have a. Uh, Council Member Alexander, followed by Council, Council Member Sanchez. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I agree. I tried to bring another council, uh, another staff person to the city council. Could you please look at it as an analyst, somebody that can help us all legislatively? 
So things like uh, when we go to Washington and we go to Sacramento, we have somebody of that stature and that nature to assist us. And also on the um, public works side, um, I don't know if the last time, but if we can add to um, the raised concrete budget, if, if we're moving money along, I mean, I know, I know we have excess amount of money. So if we could pave a few streets with that extra amount of money, that might, if that's even possible, if they could look at the recommendation there and, uh, and the raised concrete if, uh, for that budget too. Um, I don't know how much, whatever you guys come back and, and would help us with that would great. And my favorite theater, the California theater, is that in there anywhere? Yeah. It is? Yeah. Uh, Can you go to the podium so that way it's on the record? Thank you. The California Theater is actually moving forward. We had a meeting with the um, designer builder team this afternoon, identified the lighting issues that, lighting and sound issues that um, were remaining, and we should be moving forward in the next uh, few weeks to be able to start actually getting the construction done. So it is in the budget, it is in the CIP, it is funded and we are moving forward on it. You have, a, you have enough funding to complete the project? We, we may need some additional funding. It's gonna depend, they are supposed to bring back a couple of budget amendments to us uh, to address some of the changes that we've been talking to them, especially related to the facade and now related to the interior lighting issues and sound issues. But we're waiting for that proposal. We should have that in the next week. If we do need to come back to you, you we will bring it back to you. And electronic issues in the theater? Yes, that included the lighting issues as far as uh, the vibration, the uh, the incompatibility of the lighting in the in the system. They've identified it. The contractors actually brought in a theater um, company that specializes in light, sound, and staging. And they uh, the meeting that we had this afternoon was to go over those items that they're recommending. So we are waiting for their proposal and adjustments. So it is coming to you. Great. And so uh, all right. so you guys got that? Uh, public works, raised concrete, stuff like that. That's all over the city that probably needs additional funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Sanchez? Yeah, I, I just want to counter the argument that we should wait till uh, the end of the fiscal year or the right time in the fiscal cycle. Um, just over the last three or four months, um, the city manager's office has increased their personnel ongoing costs by nearly a million dollars. And that's happened over the last four months. That didn't happen at the beginning of the fiscal year or mid-year. This happened because staff, as well as the council, saw the need for these management analysts, these deputy city managers, and we put the money forward. We need now staff, as Council Member Ibarra said. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that we're top heavy, but we need more people doing some of the constituent services. Like I said, just over the last four months, we have added nearly a million dollars of personnel, of ongoing costs, to the city manager's office. But we, we won't add staff to where we need them in parks, police and public safety, uh, in, in constituent services in the council office. Uh, I don't buy the idea that we should wait till the end of the fiscal year because we didn't do that when the city manager needed nearly a million dollars of staff. Um, again, I cannot emphasize enough, we have $11.7 million in, in uh, revenue in excess of our expenditures. Um, so we have the money, this is, and we get the money from the taxpayers that we're supposed to serve. And again, this is to come back to us in April. At that point, we can say, you know what, it wasn't really a good idea. No, we don't have the financial capacity to do that. It should come back in the second meeting in April. We should have a robust conversation between the electeds and staff and come to a conclusion whether we can afford this and whether it is a priority for us. There is no harm in looking into this and seeing if we need these staff to serve the constituents that we represent. There is no harm. This budget is not being approved. I, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't approve the, the, the staff recommendations, but I want these additional four uh, amendments that I'm proposing 
to come back second meeting in April so that we can have a robust discussion and see whether we can afford this or not. So that's my, I'm still, I have, I guess it's a, it's still a motion. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Charette. Yeah, if I need to clarify myself, I'm not disagreeing with you. And, and if I wasn't clear on coming back at a reasonable time, I think you agreed that the second meeting in April, is that right? would be adequate for you to assess these things. That's all I'm saying is that we shouldn't be adding things tonight that have not been fully uh, vetted and assessed. And uh, any of the rec recommendations, I, I agree. Uh, we can all agree or to disagree on what we need, but, uh, but we need to assess them and come back with recommendations. And, and at that time, and I'm all for that. So I wanna make it clear, I wasn't saying that we need to wait till uh, the end of the fiscal year. So I, I still stand I would, by my motion yeah. that uh, we go with the night's recommendation and move it. There's a motion to uh, move forward with the staff's recommendation. Is there a second? I, I, would, I would second it, but I second with, with the return of what you're saying with a reasonable time. Yeah, actually, There's, so move forward with the staff recommendations and then come back second meeting in April with those four additional uh, recommendations that I have made. And at that point, we can decide no, we're not going to fund. Yes, we're going to fund. But we can have that robust conversation because staff has not had the time to prepare also for what I just recommended. I mean, this is, they're being surprised by this too. But I, I, I live in the city. I drive around in the city and I see what's needed and this is what we need. So I would like for that to come back. But I'm ready to move forward with the staff's recommendations on the budget amendments now. But on top of that, the second portion of my motion is to bring back those four those four uh, amendments, second meeting in April, so that we can discuss that and decide at that point whether These, we move forward with those as well. Thank you, Councilmember. but it's not just you thank with you. some assess, I mean, um, requests, it's the entire elected body. And I'd like to add in, uh, to the request the um, Office of the Council and the Mayor's staffing um, assessment by the staff to see what is the appropriate staffing level for both the Council and the Mayor. Um, and so getting feedback from the entire Council to assess for the second meeting in April to come back but for the vote tonight is to move with the staff's recommendation. Councilmember Calvin? Yes, Mayor, may I? Uh, Councilmember Sanchez is not the only one who has made recommendations and nor is he governing this meeting. So if that's the case, then all of the recommendations that have been made by the council members would need to be brought back. Thank you. I'll second that one. Thank you. Can we repeat the motion and the second? Madam City Clerk. The motion is to approve staff's recommendation as well as bringing back the council concerns to, back to the second meeting in April. And I have related to the council concerns. Um, the mayor and city council's request for assessment of additional staffing. Yes, the CSOs, the program coordinators, the records tech position, Permit what I would encourage is that city manager meet with the council and just have a, you know time to listen to what the council requests are to be brought back at the second meeting in April. It's mayor and city council's request. Mayor? Yeah, and my request was an analyst for the city, uh, the city, uh, mayor, uh, city can I, council. Mayor, can I give it a can, shot? Yes, please, I, Eddie. Uh, so council member. One, one moment, Councilman Alexander. Right, and the public works as far as, like I said, raise concrete for their budget be increased for raised concrete and any additional funds that the public works needs for the pavement of our streets because we have additional funds, not just personnel, but if we can pave more streets with the additional funds, then we should do that because if you were out there, that's all our constituents say is pave my streets. So. Can the, the motion to, you know, to be added is that, again, staff meets with the entire elected body to talk about any additional requests as, as far as fiscal impacts, you know, funding requests for projects, staffing requests, and that was brought back at the second meeting in April. Is that? So can that be added to the record to say that? I mean, city attorney, city clerk, please weigh in. I think the city manager and his staff can kind of take all of your input. It doesn't have to be so precise. I mean, 
He's gonna know what you discussed in general in generalities. We'll come back at the second meeting in April and then can tell you, hey, these are my professional recommendations of whether you can afford this position. Here's my recommendations, what we can do now. And he's, these are the things that we should put off for the bigger budget discussion. Remember, this is your mid-year budget discussion. You're not having a budget discussion. You adopted this budget. Then you amended your budget when you did your strategic plan. And today's intent was simply to update you to show you where you were after you adopted the budget, after you amended the budget for the strategic plan. Today was to say, hey, this is where you are. And aren't we starting the budget process soon? Yes. Yes. The, Can you uh, explain that, please? So the budget process is currently ongoing, and what I wanted Barbara to add is the timeline for bringing back the budget for next fiscal year. Remember, we do a biennial budget, and so that's in progress. And some of these things, like the sidewalk repairs, street pavement, that would be part of your the CIP budget. And so that's all currently in progress. What date are we scheduled to come back for us? A workshop. We're bringing that back to you on the 17th of April. Thank you. We just need some assurance, that's all. Okay, so there's a motion and a second to adopt the uh, staff's recommendation and then there will be further assessments by the suggestions by the council and the mayor with the city staff. Yes, just for clarification, because there are a few motions made. Who is the person that moved it and who is the Mayor Pro Tem? Um, I moved it. Moved it. And, and council member. And it basically was tonight's this recommendation with staff taking into consideration all that's been discussed here tonight and come back to us with some recommendations pro, con, yes, no on, on the second meeting in April. And seconded by Council Member Kevin. Thank you. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to the consent calendar. Any polls by council members? Nine. Yes. And eight. Uh, one one at a time. Number three. Just a quick one question. at a time. Councilmember Sanchez, any polls? Nine. Nine. Um, Councilmember Ibarra? I just have a question for number three. If three. Staff can help. Council Member Figueroa? None. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? None. Council Member Reynoso? Eight. Eight. And 11. Council Member Calvin? Eight, nine, and 11. Nine, nine. Council Member Alexander? Nine. Thank you. So there are polls Move for. The there Second. Po there's a poll for eight, nine, 11. Question number three and poll. Um, Move to approve the balance. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Council Member Kelvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. There's a question for item number three. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. So for number three, um, constituent reached out to me and they were asking about Harris Building if it falls under the RDA. Um, you're going to convert it into uh, part of the SLA that the Carousel Mall is right now? Because it's a privately owned currently, right? Correct. And it's, it's in the same area where the Carousel Mall, I'm not sure if they're part yeah. also of the old RDA. Yes, yeah, so, oh, hi, Josh. So that, this would give us site control, and SLA it applies to our property, city properties, public property. So okay. we would be acquiring it, not trying to dispose of it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get it's gonna get donated, which is great because after years of trying to negotiate with that property owner, it's finally um, answering to the city. But the question is, is it going to be treated as a private property, that section of the Harris Building, or if it's going to be treated as an SLA, surplus land act? It's a private property that we will acquire via a donation. So it'll, it'll stay yes. as right. private property. So if we dispose of the property through development, then SLA would apply. But for this transaction, it's a donation coming from the private sector to the city. And so what's the intent for the city with that property? We're going to tear it down or we're going to keep it? We don't know yet. Uh, no, the city does not have plans at present to tear it down. At the end of the day, that would be a council decision. But... Um, Staff does not intend on bringing forward a recommendation to demolish. 
Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ask those questions because I know we had a speaker um, asking, and then I had somebody else ask me prior to the meeting also. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Calvin? Yes, thank you, Mayor. With this donation, were there any other fees outstanding uh, in the acquiring of this property? I know that they owe the city of San Bernardino some fees, correct? I'm not aware of any outstanding fees associated with the, the donation, but I'm happy to look into that further with code and, and anything that may be lingering. Do you have the actual uh, value of the property? Uh, the, the recently assessed value in 2023 was approximately $4 million. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. No further questions? It was um, already a through. comment. Oh, Mayor Pro This is very good. This is very good that we're getting this building. This is very good. Everyone's going to be happy about it. So any discussion up here about any problems with it, this is a positive thing to be happening in the city of San Bernardino. Thank you very much, El Cortez Inglés in Spain. Thank you. It doesn't require any votes, right? Because it was already, it's just a question? Yeah, and with that, I'll, I'll move to approve. Okay, Councilmember Alexander. Thank you. Um, now that we're responsible for this building, how are we securing this building? We've conducted preliminary uh, assessment on the, on the external uh, site for vulnerabilities, and we'll be moving uh, after we acquire the property to, to firm up the security uh, vulnerabilities with Public Works and Police Department. Are we using private security to secure this building? Because it's right next to the mall, and you know how the mall went down with the, the numerous break-ins, so forth and so on. So it's majorly important how we secure this building because now we are responsible. That is certainly noted, and, and the situation is fluid as we took this you know, consideration for the donation very, in a very short amount of time, but we're happy to bring back information on how we'll, we'll assess the security vulnerabilities and boarding up. Thank you, I appreciate that. Do you know when that's gonna happen? Uh, we, we hope to have the building under city control within the next couple of weeks, so I would anticipate probably 45 to 60 days. You come back before this council with your security plan and how we're going to secure this building and so forth and so on? I don't want to speak to, to that because that's public works and, and their Public their works. How, council how? member Alexander, if yes. I may. I don't know if you recall through the strategic initiatives, there was some additional funding that the council approved for private security. Mm -hmm. And we expanded that. The contract currently uh, resides with the police department, but there's flexibility within the existing agreement and funding to incorporate additional sites if after we assess the security of the site, if there's some type of amendment, we can bring that back and we can most certainly bring back um, any updates that you all require with regard to the security. In fact, in your um, mid-year motion, right, there was um, the council feedback, and part of that was the status on the initiative, so. Okay, well, thank you. I just don't want our unsheltered population to uh, further damage our, our property. Thank you. Please cover the votes. No further questions? Is motion? Is there a motion? Second. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item number eight. Uh, we'll start with Councilmember Reynoso. Yeah, regarding this, um, just concern me that the money is intended for this uh, $200,000 allocation to come from our street sweeping signage. And my question specifically in the staff report is uh, this line on packet page 256, it's just a small paragraph on the initial, measure SCIP surplus funds will be used to cover the additional work for the Carousel Mall out of the street sweeping signage project. The cost for these, for these street sweeping signs will be paid by the contractor, which is a requirement for the contractor to cover the cost. I just want to know who the contractor is in this. It wasn't that clear to me. Yeah, basically this is, uh uh, first of all, Azam, city engineer, good evening, council. Good to see you. Uh, uh, so what this is, is uh, currently there is a funding available in Measure S, which is not being utilized. The uh, street, uh, street sweeping uh, signage is part of the birthday contract. So this is additional funding that we can utilize in making sure that we address uh, issues where we have a shortfall of funding. Can I ask you then where we are with the street sweeping signs? 
the street sweeping signs basically was a part of the BIRTEC contract, and we're supposed to do a pilot program in the north end of town when uh, the previous uh, 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 staff left the city was probably put on hold. And uh, my understanding at that time, it was uh, due, due to the uh, community not accepting uh, so many signs in the community, and the amount of signs due to the, uh, due to the uh, sign pollutions was put, put on hold and, until further discussions. Correct me if I'm wrong. I remember when we were exploring the rate-free hike, <clears throat> they were kind of, Vertec was kind of leveraging like, hey, give us the hike and we'll do the street sweeping. And it would cost them about, if I, my memory serves me correctly, $1.2 million or somewhere around there. This just, it's, it doesn't feel comfortable because it feels like the money, like it should be happening right now. It should have happened already. People have been clean streets. We need clean streets. We need signs first. So I guess I need clarity on, like, when will that actually happen? I, I know your answer. I'm not trying to berate you or anything. I'm just genuinely, people want to know when street sweepers are actually going to come, first and foremost. That's a major issue, especially in the northern part of town. The street sweeper does not come around, ever. And uh, the street sweeping signage is the first step. And so really I want to know what the first step is so that people can have an idea when their streets will be cleaned regularly. Council Member Reynoso, could we bring back an update on that if that's the council's desire? Because this is this item's related no to the Carousel that. Mall. And um, but it's But you're taking the money that we allocated as a council. I understand, I'll be frank with you. I don't trust that Burtek's gonna do this in a timely fashion. $200,000 coming directly from the council is something that we can guarantee we see results for. And so what I'm telling to you is I am comfortable with that, but I am uncomfortable in that case approving this then. But I know that there's obviously demand for it. And if I could just make a procedural input here, that's absolutely fine for a decision maker on the council to say I'm not comfortable on an item because I'm not understanding the funding. That is absolutely within your purview. I think the issue is then getting into a broader conversation about Vertex sweeping, which is a separate contract. So it's totally appropriate for you to give staff direction and say, I'm not comfortable doing this. Staff, can you... I want, I want the funding explained to me because I think there's other implications. I just want to make sure that we're not violating the Brown Act, especially because we notice this as a special meeting and having a conversation about Vertex street sweeping. But I think it would be appropriate to give staff direction. That kind of feels like, if I'm not allowed to talk about that, that feels like it was listed as contractor on purpose to not be able to talk oh, no. about that. I, no, I'm just, I'm trying to say it's not, you're not, not that you're not allowed to mention what it. What I'm telling you is, it. what but you're saying, it's absolutely legal for what I just said then. Because what contractor you've said was so far question. is absolutely legal, but if right. you're going to get into a conversation about where is Vertec, when are they street sweeping, that's going to go beyond this contract. Everything you've said so far is within the. With, is that's within absolutely the connected. So, all right, that's fine. And, and if um, Council Member, one moment, uh, I have then Council Member Calvin, then I can call on you. If someone can just provide me some clarity, I do believe that we allocated over two point million, or at least two point million, for street street sweeping signs throughout throughout the entire city. Where's that money, and why haven't we begun to uh, put our streets our signs up within the city? Legal. Thank you. The funding originally was set up to to provide a street sweeping enforcement program, I believe. It's, it was street signage. Sweeping signage. Signage. Because they can't indicates, street sweep because of the signs that aren't there. Right. And so what, what the issue really is is that in order for you to notify the public of the day of the street sweeping, you have to have the signs. I do know that there have been um, service issues relating to the street sweeping um, and that they, they are working to resolve those. But the signage program has been kind of suspended because of some of the issues that are going on. We will eventually, as you have been made aware, we are looking at additional issues relating to BIRTEC, the rate study. We are looking, well. Oh. I see, now now you're going back into I, I, uh, what, the, to, what, the, what the city attorney just stated. This is not about BIRTEC. I did not mention BIRTEC. It, I'm asking you for the two it's, point, it's where, where's the $2 million science uh, funding that we allocated probably two years ago 
for the city to be um, have to be provided signage throughout the entire city so that when Woodstead Company comes down the street, cars are not parked there and we can enforce that because there is signage in place. What I'm saying then now you're taking, you're wanting to take money to uh, only apply it to this particular area. We're questioning- Mayor, through the chair, please. The funding, where's the funding? that was allocated for street signage. That's what the, we're the talking fund, about. The funding, the funding is, is there. We have come before you tonight with a recommendation to use a portion of that funding to provide this additional work at the Carousel Mall. If the council does not want, wish us to use that, then we will go back and we will look at uh, other sources of funding if that's not what the council wants. I can't answer the, because I've, only been here for three months now. I can't answer what your plan was for the street sweeping signs other than to know in general what we do with enforcement and we do with um, street sweeping. But I can come back to you if, if the council does not wish to use this funding um, to offset these costs, then we will come back to you with uh, another recommendation and we would ask that you continue this item to the next meeting. Thank you very much. Madam City, uh, Madam Assistant City Attorney, I'm sorry, City Manager. Anything to add on where Council this Councilwoman Calvin, Councilman Ringnoso, Mayor and Council. If um, there is a desire, we can swap out the funding to support the amendment. We do need to finish the demolition work of the Carousel Mall. So if um, we can incorporate an up a status update in your budget the oh. second meeting in April. I can, what I, what I can tell you is that the Public Works Department has not been exempt from the staffing challenges that occur throughout the city. So while the council did allocate the $2 million, staff found an indication in your current agreement with Vertec that that's covered in that agreement. And so what I would recommend, if you're not comfortable with this funding source, let's use general fund, get this approved, if that is the council's desire to complete the demolition at the Carousel Mall, and then the second meeting in April, we'll come back with, with an update. Oh. Thank you. I council Member Ibarra, oh. followed yes, by Council Member Alexander. I was actually gonna make that motion that we do not use this funding um, just for the Carousel Mall demolition project. Um, there is, like you mentioned, Ms. City Manager, um, the contract with Vertec that we, we should be, you know, reviewing and talking with, with the reps um, with Vertec. It should not be included here um, for the Carousel Mall, though. If we can find other funding, that'd be great. So I'll make a motion that... Um, there's a motion. Staff. Second. And there's a second. Approving staff recommendation with the um, change of the how we're using the funds. And to be used from the general fund. Is that correct? Okay. Call for the vote. Um, Madam City Clerk, can you go through the motion, uh, motion for the record and then call for the votes? It's approving so staff's yeah. recommendation but swapping the general funding fund. from the street signage, street sweeping signage to general fund. Is that the motion, oh, I said Council other Member funding, Other funding. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, make that motion that we follow um, the new staff recommendation of changing out the CIP street sweeping signage surplus in, from the, uh, get that money from the general fund. I'm, I'm gonna pull my second. So there's the motion and second? Oh, okay. Council Member I move approval Reynoso. on the staff recommendation as it is. Just a quick question. Um, if you feel comfortable answering, off the, kind of off the top of your head, would this come from anywhere besides the general fund? Or are we pretty much gonna look at that in, in two, a month? I, I think that the, uh, the source of the general fund would actually allow us to move this thing forward and get the vendor paid. Um, I don't know if there's any other funding. We've been in our department, when we prepared the staff report, we did scour and look for 
any additional funds that we could use that were specific funds. So the recommendation at this point would be that if you want to use the general fund to, to pay this, uh, that's probably the best. We can come back and try to find additional funding from, uh, you know, a different source than the street sweeping signs. I'll second the motion on the floor, the most recent one. So there's the motion and a second. Yeah. Council yeah. Member yeah. Sanchez, did you have a question? Yes. Um, so Birdtech is contractually obligated to fulfill their responsibilities with the street signs and the street sweeping. So we can pull money away from there. So we're going to be burning $200,000 by using general fund money when we could have used money that is going to pay for something that Birdtech is contractually obligated to fulfill. Unfortunately, I don't have the details on the franchise agreement in terms of, of that particular item, Councilman. Um, I, again, because of my short term here, I don't know what the original plan was for the, the street sweeping signs and how that was put together. So we then, I, then I'll back. fill you in. Um, uh, Burtek, Burtek in negotiations for the last Council year. Council member, we're not, I think. I'm not having finished. Madam C. Turk, can he speak on the Burtek? Items. I, I just yeah, want to caution because us. It's germane, it's germane to the conversation where we're going to pull money from uh, from the street sweeping sign uh, from the street sweeping signs when Birdtech is involved in either partially or fully funding that. So it's germane to the conversation. Yeah. If Birdtech's going to pay for that, then we can pull that funding and pay for uh, and pay for this. So exactly, uh, Mayor, Council, Councilmember Sanchez, um, I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, uh, myself and Lynn are currently have been working through with Burtech over the last few months. Uh, they want us to do an extension with them here soon. However, this funding is the funding that we're recommending for you all to get this completed because if there's demobilization on that mall, this cost will come back about two to three times higher. So we, I, whether it's general fund or the fund that we've allocated, I recommend we allocate the funds already and we will figure it out. If we need to come back to you all and either supplant the general fund back where we took it from, or uh, we have issues with the contractor, or we have issues with where the money originally came from, we'll be racked to council. I move the staff recommendation. There's including a motion. The funding source. I, thank you. There's a motion second. Originally, let's call for the votes for that, please. Councilmember Sanchez. Which motion? Mine? Councilmember Sherrett. No. Oh, okay. Uh, second, and yes. Yes. Council, okay. Council Member Ibarra? No. Can, Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Council Member Calvin? No. Council Member Alexander? Nay. Okay, the motion passes four to three. Thank you. Next um, item pulled, number nine. Council Member Calvin, followed by Council Member Alexander. Then Sa Sa Council Member Sanchez. This is the cooperative agreement between, with Omnitrans for the E Street Median Project. Yes, I just wanted to know why wasn't this a discussion item? Councilwoman Calvin, the way the item was agendized, it's on consent, like I mentioned last meeting. The placement of an item is a judgment call on staff. And so this item was considered non-controversial. Okay. So I guess we can consider controversy. We had a business owner that was here and discussed the issue. Um, and so uh, I would, uh, for the business owner, I'm not sure if they're still here, but if we would explain why we came to this, to, oh, why we came to this decision. As you may be aware, Omnitrans operates the SBX bus system along E Street and out Hospitality Lane. There have been quite a few, I couldn't tell you exactly how many accidents in which traffic is coming across the unprotected lanes because all we have is delineators, plastic delineators. And so there have been multiple accidents that have occurred along the route because of that. The, um, the Caltrans and the city, and I'll ask Azam to correct this if I'm, I'm incorrect, 
we built, we actually did install a median down on Hospitality Lane, which resulted in an immediate reduction of the number of traffic accidents caused because of people coming out of driveways and turning across into the path of the busways. This median is actually, uh, this agreement is to explore the expansion of that median all the way up to 10th Street along E Street. It is a safety measure. Um, we are, this allows us to continue the discussion with Caltrans to deter, or Omnitrans, excuse me, um, to determine if a median is actually the most appropriate way. There could be other alternatives, but this is the first step in the process for us to be able to um, formally explore the construction or the potential construction of this median um, from uh, Fairview and from Hospitality all the way up to 10th Street. So it's just merely for exploration? Yes, that's why it's a cooperative agreement. You are not approving the actual construction or the design of the median. You are merely giving us the authority to be able to you know, work with Omnitrans to explore this further. And if that will we, be brought back yes, to us before? Yes, ma'am. If it comes, if we do move forward, we will bring that back as an award of a contract. To Thank you. you, sir. You're welcome. Sir. I just want to add also on E, we brought to you last year a local roadway safety plan that was approved by the city council. E Street uh, along the SBX line is one of the highest collisions in the city. So uh, adding this median uh, will be, will reduce these collisions. And currently uh, the, uh, pro there is prohibitions uh, currently with the existing uh, delineators at this location. So that will prohibit uh, people in turning. The only disadvantage is when turning movements out of the driveways for loading and unloading, you still have the lane width in the travel lanes and then the lane width in the SBX line, and the median will be only in the center and will extend between 12 inches to 18 inches in width. That's all, just like the one we did on hospitality. Thank you. Councilmember Alexander? Thank you for this report. Did, you, did anyone, anyone talk to the business owners before you did this? Again, this is a, the, uh, the first. Did, did anyone not talk to this, the business owners before? Not at before? this point. Okay, so you didn't talk to the business owners. That should have been your first step because then you might have found out if they like it, if it works for their business or anything like that. It should have been talked to by them first. It, it really should have. So it didn't have to come up there. And second, nobody that I know of likes XBX. That, that's a disaster, and I know that that center medium for SBX reduced the businesses in San Bernardino, I think I read some reports sometime by 14 to 20% because it didn't work. And now we're here gonna do it again? And we didn't even talk to the business owners? I would beg of you to talk to the business owners first before you proceed forward with this plan. That, that's, that's, and my, and, no, in fact, I make a motion that this comes back before us when you, after you talk to the small business owners that it, it affects first. Thank you. Councilmember Sanchez? Yeah, uh, the SBX line is here to stay. And whether it's a concrete barrier or those plastic cones, what are they called? Uh, we call delineators. them delineators. Sorry. Yeah. Well, delineators? They're not supposed to be crossing there. Legally, they cannot cross there. So they're only complaining because these are individuals who have torn out those uh, uh, dividers, those plastic dividers that make one of our main corridors in our city look like it's perpetually under construction. So they're not supposed to cross through there. So what happens is they've been torn out and they're running through there. It's causing accidents. It's causing people to get into serious uh, um, what fronting collisions with these these uh, rapid transit buses? They're not supposed to be crossing there, and they're upset now because with with a curb there that will increase safety as well as increase the aesthetics of one of the main corridors in our city is now going to be a physical barrier from them crossing illegally through that through several double yellow lines because it's two rapid lanes, one in each direction for that rapid transit bus. Um, my only concern, and the reason I pulled it, I know we have a cost-sharing agreement with uh, Omnitrans, which is, I think, why it's on consent. 
we're basically being given over a million dollars for free. Now, I think, uh, per the agreement, they will pay 50% of a total price tag of, I think it's $2.5 million. I think we need to spend a little more. So if their total cost ends up being, or their cost sharing ends up being 40%, I'm perfectly fine with that, as long as it's not just a simple concrete curb. What I want is I want a length uh, that is maybe a foot, two feet, with either stamped concrete or river rock, we have to make sure it's gonna look good because we're gonna have to live with this for the next 20 to 30 years and I want it to look good, which means that it will maybe exceed our current estimates of $2.5 million, which means Omnitrans will end up spending a little less than 50%, but we'll still get $1.3 million out of them to clean up East Street all the way from, is it hospitality? Uh, fairway, fairway, which is the one intersection north of the bridge. Oh, okay. Yeah. All the way up. I mean, anyone can drive through there now. It looks terrible. People ask me all the time, is it under construction? Why does it look so bad? Did the city run out of money? We should be putting up a curb just like there is on Hospitality Lane. You, you go down Hospitality Lane, those accidents don't happen there, people aren't getting seriously injured, and it's aesthetically pleasing. And now we have Omnitrans offering to pay 50 or 40 percent, whatever ends up happening. I need assurances from staff right here on record that we will go, we will go with river rock or stamped concrete. We need to make sure, and I get it, it it'll, it'll end up costing us half a million dollars more, but for the next 30 years to have a, a street that's aesthetically pleasing, a barrier that's, that's going to provide safety and look good is well worth the cost. Um, so I need those assurances from staff here that you guys will include, whether it requires expanding that curb, include stamped concrete or river rock. Can I get that commitment? Thank, Thank you, Mayor, Council Member. Mr. Mayor, City Manager. Yeah, Mayor, Council, Council Member Sanchez. You're refer so if when we put the median up, there's still going to be curb. You mean in the middle of that? A exactly. Okay, exactly. Yeah. No problem with that. But let me also, uh, staff agrees with you. We need additional money. Now, Mayor, Council, if I may, this is on consent because... Omnitrans is our partners. They have a severe problem that they've run into. It's a liability problem, costing them lives, issues, and money. You guys are welcome to turn it down, and we'll take the liability. That's what's going to happen. They're our partners. And they came to us saying this is the most used area in the city that has the most consistent accidents and people getting hurt. This needs to happen. And this is their request, and that's why it's on consent. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? Between you and Sanchez, I don't need to say anything because that's exactly what I was going to say. And I'm with, I'm with my colleague on making it aesthetically pleasing, make it as wide as possible. I think you said 12 to 18 inches. Maybe we make it 19 or 20. Um, uh, kidding, all kidding aside, we need it to be uh, pleasing. Correct me, I, I drive there, but I can't think right now. South of Mill Street... First of all, I want to say, too, as has been said, that conversation is over, having a conversation with businesses. That should have been done before we ever put that transit in, and that was done many, many years ago. And, and having conversations with businesses about whether they like it or not, I can give you the answer. They're all going to say, no, we don't want anything. But, that's, but the SBX line is going to stay there, and it's still going to be illegal to cross it. So we've got to stop them from crossing it. And those candlesticks, as they commonly referred to, don't do that. So this is the way to do it. But south of, uh, I think it's south of Mill Street, does that go, does that go, in other words, are we going to be able to keep four lanes, two lanes both direction, kind of up here, uh, out here on East Street? If we decided to go to a, a wider median, we have to do a reduction in lane width. So Lane to, width or yeah, reduce a lane uh, or eliminate uh, a lane? Re reduction in lanes and possibly reduction in lane width too to accommodate a wider median. Okay, and, my, my, and I would like to look into that and, and uh, through traffic studies or whatever else, whether or not we can get by with that. I think right out here, is it just really one lane on East Street? 
On yes. each side, one lane each direction? Yes, along the outside so of the building on E and this, the vicinity. We're not going to try to maintain, you know, E Street used to be, I think, four lanes, wasn't it? Four two, uh, two, two and two, two, and two lanes two. in north, yes. And with the SBX line, you, you just almost can't have that anymore, right? There is some locations on E that a reduction to uh, one through lanes uh, uh, in each direction uh, based on the initial design that was done in 2014, 2015. Um, and with regard to businesses, I, I'm empathetic and sympathetic to their concerns, but I've been in other cities that, uh, that have these medians, and people figure out a way to get to that restaurant or that retail store or whatever. And it does take maybe some time, but we've got to think about the safety. We've got to think about the aesthetics of this thing. Um, I, I, I think this SBX line has been a disaster. It may... It may pay for itself in 20 or 30 or 40 years, uh, but it's here to stay, and we've got to live with it and do the best we can with it. So I do support this item, and uh, I understand clearly why it was on consent. So I don't know if it's been moved, but I'll move it. Uh, There's a motion. Oh, I, will, I will second with a friendly amendment that, uh, that staff... Um, I don't know. Do you need to come back for our... I would prefer you come back for our approval. Because what I'm concerned about is that it gets put up and it's just the curb. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't support to, that either. I, don't I need it to that. make sure that it includes, uh, you know, it's going to include, it's going to have to include a, 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 a couple inches wide for the river rock or, or the stamped concrete, but it needs to look decent. Now, can we, can we just give that direction and that's, that's set in stone? Or do you want to come back for council's approval on the design work? Madam Assistant City, uh, City Manager, can you please respond? So, C Council Member Sanchez, this is step one of a multi-step process. This is to enter into the agreement to, the, to receive, right, the money, the allocation from Omnitrans, the way staff currently geared up the staff report and what they intend on doing is pursuing grants to secure the other funding. So there will be plenty of opportunity for you to provide staff your input and feedback as to the design elements that you would like. Well, to at least in the staff report, I mean, we're going to pursue that grant funding, but if that grant funding doesn't go through, we will fund this through city general funds. We are the lead agency, and I don't think I remember the last time that we approved design work on a public works project. That's why this will be the last time that we see other than to maybe um, approve a contract with the designer and the, uh, and the contractor that actually does the work, I can't remember the last time that this council approved the design work for a public works project. So this is, this is our last chance to opine on the actual design that's going to be implemented. So that's, that's why, because what's going to end up happening is say, oh, well, we already approved the the uh, designer, the architect, or not the architect, in this case, mm -hmm. the consultant. We already approved the general contractor. It's already been done. You guys, didn't, it didn't need to come to you for approval on the design. That's why it needs to happen here and now, unless we're going to get a commitment from staff that you're going to bring back and you're going to show it up on the screen. We'll hey, look, this is how the curb's going to look. We can bring it back. Is that what you're going to do? We will do that. Yes. Good. Okay. Then that is my motion. Is that, is you fine with that? Second. There's a motion and a second. Madam City Clerk, Council Member Ibar, one moment. Yes, yeah, so my concern right here on E Street, um, I, I, I had a lot of businesses close out along E Street between Highland and way below, I think 9th, 9th Street, as is. There's a difference, and I hope my colleagues understand, the difference between hospitality and E Street is that E Street is one lane only on both sides, currently, right now. You want to add a median that's thick, it's going to further decrease the size of those lanes. You're also going to stop people from trying to turn into certain businesses, furthering, affecting them. Um, I, I would like to see what kind of designs we can come up with. I'm not okay with having a thick mm -hmm. uh, median. The, and I don't know if you've driven oh, down Rialto and E Street. There's people crossing the, the train, the the train stopped there, over to the street, they're jaywalking either way. They're still going to try to jump over the streets, whether you have a median that's 
tall, high, thick, they're, they're gonna find a way. Um, I just came from Washington, D.C., and in Washington, D.C., they had little bumps to separate the bike, the, the bus lane from the regular traffic, and there's still cars going into that lane. So people are going to disregard whatever barrier we put up there. Um, I don't like the candlesticks, the holders. Well, they don't go past 9th Street. No, I, I, don't, I don't like how they look, though. But south of, of 9th, there, there's quite a bit. And um, I don't know. Uh, May just my feedback is we'd like to, I'm, I'm okay with working with Omnitrans with this, but they need to come up and show us the designs that they have. We will definitely do that. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Please call for the votes. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? No. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Nay. Okay, the motion passes five to two. Thank you. Next uh, polled item, number 11, Councilmember Reynoso, followed by Councilmember Calvin. Yeah, this is quick. Um, I appreciate you bringing these forward. There's one that's not necessarily, I guess, on this tranche, but College Avenue. College Avenue is essentially a cul-de-sac. Uh, it's behind, it's off of University. Right before you get to Ralph's and KFC, you make a right. That's a cul-de-sac, essentially, because it's a dead end if you just keep going. Street is in terrible condition, has been for quite a while. Um, I guess I, I can't expect an answer from you now, but if the next time we see these, hopefully it's not too far in the future, like less than a year hopefully, just slated to make sure that it's like priority for the fifth ward in particular. That's definitely, I would say, like one of our worst streets. I see 27th though from Davidson. I know it's in Ward 2, but everybody uh, uses that road. But College Avenue, I just wanted to put that on there. That's, all, that's the only reason I pulled it. We'll put that on our list and uh, see if we can get that done for you. Thank, thank you. Council Member Calvin. Thank you. Um, I have a question that I've been asking for several years. When will a paving management system be brought to this council? We received the proposals last week. We're in the process. We're reviewing the proposals and coming back to council in the next month or so for a recommendation on how to move forward with the uh, consultant selection process. Thank you, great news, happy to hear that. I'm really happy to see these streets that are on here within the sixth ward, but I don't think that these are some of the oldest streets that have yet to be paved. And so I was forwarding some to uh, the Public Works Department, and so I would definitely like for you to take a look at those streets. Uh, uh, Duffy and Macy, 7th and 6th, they even have some actual sinkholes. Um, and so um, I have sent some pictures and stuff in uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, to, for you all to take a look at that. They, the community tells me those streets have not been paved in 40 years. So uh, if we could uh, take a look at those and add them um, or you know, look at maybe exchanging. Something has to be done though because I think it's, it's crucial and I would love to take you on a tour to, to drive that area to, so that you can be sure. Those, those areas we are aware of and we will be addressing them for you be addressing them, but move, would, I mean, to rate them, because the paving management system will help us to rate streets, right? And to be able to see, because if you haven't been paved in 40 years, you can't continue to pave streets that have been paved 10 years ago or five years ago, and then you have some in the city that it's been 40 years since they've been paved. So that's really why I was continuing to ask for the paving management system. but. If you're going, if I we go out and look at that, how will we then be able to incorporate? Where's the funding? Do we have funding to be able to incorporate those streets? I think I think it's reasonable for us to go out there and take a look at those areas. Um, we have been made aware of some of the streets in the in the sixth ward and the condition, and we are looking at a variety of approaches to be able to address those. We do understand that those streets are in fairly poor condition. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I'd be happy to go out and ride with you too. Sounds good. Thank you, Council Member. There's a motion. I'll second it. Second. And there's a second by Council Member Reynoso. Please call for the votes. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa? Count Mayor Pro Tem? Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. And now we move on to Mayor and City Council updates and reports on conferences and meetings. Council Member Sanchez? 
Uh, no, nothing to report at this. You know what? Uh, we just, just a couple minutes ago, we just approved millions of dollars worth of street repaving. Uh, and I know maybe some people who aren't watching very keenly might have just uh, overseen that, but uh, this, is this, this is how a city uh, moving in the right direction looks like. I know sometimes we, we get into the uh, weeds about a couple issues, but if you look at this, I mean, we're passing CFDs, we're getting streets repaved. Uh, this morning I did a tour with my colleagues, uh, the Mayor Helen and Juan Figueroa. Uh, a hundred million dollar project is happening right now in the first ward. Um, the Mount Vernon Bridge, uh, without that, uh, the west side neighborhoods are split in half. And that is a commitment of both the state, federal, county, and city level. Of I think the total expenditure is going to end up being nearly a quarter of a billion dollars invested in the west side neighborhoods of San Bernardino. So when people say, no, they forgot us about, about us out here, how many neighborhoods can say, that they've had that sort of investment in their backyard. So we're headed in the right direction. We get into fights over here over some of the details and the color of the car, but we are moving forward. So just keep an eye, we're, we're getting things done. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ibarra. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been attending several regional uh, meetings. A lot of them are addressing homelessness in our city. So I'm gonna put the call out there again. There are several agencies in our city that have room and beds available for homeless that have not contacted our city staff. So if you are receiving, whether it's federal funding, state funding, or just a private source, please let our staff know that you have rooms available for, for the unhoused. Um, right now, a couple of weeks ago, I found out that the city of Redlands is relocating um, their unhoused into some of the agencies within our city. So um, just an idea that we have the beds in our city, but we're not accounting for them. So I just want to put that out there. Um, I also went to Washington, D.C., and, of course, we thanked our, our legislators up in Washington, D.C. for the funding that we are receiving as a city. For the first time, we're getting some funding finally back in, and it's going to help our bridges, our streets, our lights. Um, I provided information to our city staff from the conferences so they can register and we can definitely apply for the grants that are coming down from the federal government. And uh, that's, oh no, and then we went yesterday to the, uh, the ribbon cutting for the pet, uh, mobile pet clinic and uh, it was a wonderful turnout. Um, there's a lot more to be done for the animal shelter. And one thing I brought, uh, I want an idea that I brought, I, I wanna share with staff. Um, I'd like to us to start working on on an incentive program for people that are in specific careers to come buy houses within in our city. Um, also, maybe an incentive for people who want to work for our city and maybe loan forgiveness, loan payment assistance if they want to purchase at our city. And that's something that we were discussing over in Washington, D.C. Um, how do we bring the jobs of the tomorrow into our city and people that are gonna work it, whether it's in public works, um, engineering, parks, parking, people that have that experience, if we can find ways to incentivize them to um, come work for our city, help us out, and at the same time, become homeowners here. So um, that's our, some of the good topics that we discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Figueroa. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I too, along with a couple of my colleagues, had the opportunity to attend the 100. Was it the 100th? It was the 100th annual uh, National League of Cities in Washington D.C. as well. Where we had opportunities to to learn through workshops uh, and other opportunities for grants and things of that nature for transportation and infrastructure uh, services, after school and summer programs and. Uh, other innovations to, to build a strong uh, local economy as well. And so I, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to have been present for that as well. Um, I, I do want to thank uh, the San Manuel Band of Mission, of Mission Indians as well, as they uh, just yesterday hosted their, uh, I believe it's their 14th annual uh, Forging Hope Yahweh Awards, as they recognized a uh, few local uh, and regional nonprofit organizations. They, they've done so much. Uh, for the region, and I just wanted to say thank you for their recognition of so many great organizations in the community. Um, and, and I think Councilmember Sanchez also mentioned it, and, and I want to thank the mayor as well for the invitation 
uh, along with SBCTA for the Mount Vernon Bridge. It is coming along, it, it's looking great, and we're still on schedule for it to be completed uh, by, uh, by, by about summer, late summer of next year. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, very quickly, I also attended yesterday's uh, Yawa Awards uh, and want to congratulate one of our local agencies, the uh, uh, Salvation Army. They do a great job in providing services to uh, those that, that need their services, and so uh, I did attend that. I did uh, miss, um, I tried to get back from Ontario in time to see the, the uh, dog grooming or dog uh, whatever whatever they're calling that that bus and i pulled in and i had missed the event but uh congratulations to the to getting that uh that thing going and i think it's going to be great for the community but that's all i have at this time thank you thank you mayor Tam. council member reynoso yeah i don't have uh any conferences or anything i just want to thank the staff for all the work that you do i know there's a lot of things that happen inside of city hall and a lot of it you know, may never come to light, but as a council member, I've unfortunately have to witness a lot of it. I'm sorry to see you go, Ms. Adelia Eveland. Um, I understand why you're leaving, and I congratulate you on that. I'm sorry for everything you've had to go through in this city, um, but I appreciate everything that you have done. And I want you to know that if no one else gives you your recognition, you are a gem, truly. And so thank you for your service. I wish you the best, and um, hope you have a good summer. Enjoy your family. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Calvin? Well, I'll just pick right up right there and uh, thank uh, Assistant City Manager Eddie Evelyn uh, for all the wonderful things that you have brought forward here in the city of San Bernardino and all the things that you tried to bring here to the city of San Bernardino. I appreciate all, each and every one of them. Um, we've been on a couple of excursions together, and those trips have all been very, very uh, informative, and I thank you for everything that you've brought forward. So I, I pray that you and your family's next journey will be a much pleasant one. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Welcome, sir, to uh, City of San Bernardino. We appreciate you. Hopeful that we have not scared you too much tonight, uh, but put your seatbelt on. Um, we do appreciate uh, you bringing all your skills to us here in the City of San Bernardino, and I look forward to what you're going to be able to bring to us. Um, thank all of you staff for all that you, that you guys do. Uh, it is one of my greatest joys to be able to look over this dais and see all of your faces and all of your smirks. <laughs> but I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, and thank you, City of San Bernardino, for always coming in and doing your part, too, and speaking before the dais, because you know we do work for you, and this is your city, and then the more that you all take control of that, the better this city will be. Um, I want to say that I did attend uh, the National League of Cities Conference in Washington, D.C., but, you know, I was a little bit disappointed um, because we didn't have a staff there, to that gave us uh, and set up meetings for us. So what I would like to say is that the, what we've asked for from the council's office, that that would be a person inside of our office that then could establish all of our meetings with, on the federal level, state level, every time that we go to a conference because Jeff has done a fantastic job and so has Corey when they've gone with us and making sure that we were on point and that those meetings were set up for us. But unfortunately, we did get to go see, uh, fortunately, we did get in to see um, Congressman Pete Aguilar. He was gracious enough to take my call and to make sure that we got in to see him and to discuss the monies, the funds that he has given to our city, and I greatly appreciate that. So thank you all tonight. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Alexander. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Elliott, welcome aboard. I look, look forward for great things that you're going to do for our city. I appreciate you. Uh, ACM, well, Goodbye. Don't forget to press the easy button. <laughs> I, don't forget to press the easy button. I appreciate you and thank you for all that you have done for the city. And I just echo my voice among the symphonies of we're sorry to see you go. Um, yes, uh, I attended the Forge Hope Awards at Yamava. I would like to thank Yamava and Chairwoman Lynn for all she does for the city and all the things that she has continues to do for the city that Yamaha provides. We appreciate you. Uh, Salvation Army, um, they will receive one of those awards and I have to give a special shout out in the Salvation Army to Miss Naomi. Miss Naomi taught me about half of what I know about the unsheltered in the city. She does an absolutely fantastic job. So Miss Naomi, you get an A plus. Uh, also attended the uh, Joint County Communication Center opening 
uh, venture where fire, police, all going to open up a brand new communication center in the city of San Bernardino. The sheriff was there, three supervisors. It's going to be an actually fantastic uh, uh, building. And I would just like to say a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ware, who was the most worshipful grand master of the state of California, passed away suddenly. Um, he was a friend of mine, so um, to, his, to him and his family, uh, you have my prayers. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I don't have much to update other than I just want to say thank you to staff for working with our partners, uh, especially with the Omnitrans, SBCTA, with the Fire County, county itself, because that's very critical, such as the Mount Vernon Bridge that we saw progress today, the, um, uh, the median for the E Street, which is very important to address the safety concerns. And I sit on the Omnitrans board, and I know that was the biggest issue that they brought forward was there's huge safety concerns on that median. So thank you for bringing that forward to start the conversation conversation and exploration as to what that solution looks like and addressing the concerns of the council, uh, what they would like to see that um, to be, right? So thank you so much. We will now resume with public comments. For items not on the agenda, Madam City Clerk, please call the speakers. I believe we have six speakers. Sarah Each speaker Ro will have three minutes. Sarah Robles, Jose Mendoza, Mike Hartley, Dolores Armstead, Yasmin and Al Palazzo. Sarah R. City Council members, Mayor Helen Tran and Madam City Attorney, I was referred to you by the City Clerk's Office as the Oversight Committee to follow up on a public records request submitted on February 2nd, 2024. Usually these are very time sensitive. Uh, it was regarding Montoya's now infamous letter of intent that he discussed at the January 31st, 2024 public study session involving his office, Susie Soren, and Stifle regarding an $80 million bond. The CM's office continues to report no responsive records to my public records request, which is a direct obstruction and violation of the Brown Act. Council members, some of you were equally surprised to learn about this letter of intent. And Ms. Calvin, I wholeheartedly commend your efforts to bringing transparency and public accountability to San Bernardino. You more than deserve that seat up on that dais, but due to circumstances regarding your right in candidacy, you were robbed of another term. But I've digressed. Council and Mayor Tran, it's your role to provide adequate oversight regarding all fiscal decisions taking place in the city, whether they are already taking place or if there is merely an intent to commit to a contract. I'll remind you that Montoya, who is probably in the hallway uh, listening in, he keeps coming in and out, um, publicly stated, we already have a letter of intent with them, Stifle, and all the project personnel put on this will go ahead and be reimbursed through the bond proceeds. He went on to say, we need to move as quickly as possible to get everything complete with a dire sense of urgency. Montoya and his office continue to withhold this information. It's public knowledge that Charles Montoya, the city manager uh, that you voted on in October, has previously been terminated and is currently going through a lawsuit in the city of Avondale. He's been fired from Avondale and the town of Florence, resigned from Watsonville and town of Castle Rock, all small cities. And while he's going through the required due process, it doesn't change the fact that he's been accused of the same type of things, mismanagement of funds, not only that, but have you not read the headlines and controversy surrounding Stifle's predatory sales practices recently and the FINRA fines and sanctions that are being imposed on them? There are reasons why everything needs to be public record. I hope you see my frustration when Montoya and his office refuse to comply with my public records request. I hope we can get a resolution on this matter as soon as possible. Thank you for allowing me the public comment for the general on agendized item. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Dolores Armstead. I think I heard this evening that a staff member actually reprimanded the council regarding a budget item. Sounded like it. All I can say is, dang, that's really sad. 
It looked really bad for the city. Why are the city meetings changed to 5 o'clock? We're a city of over 200,000 people, and you've taken away the ability for many of the residents to come after work. But we know why. We know why. It's to keep the public from coming here and watching what you're doing. We already know that. San Bernardino citizens, you need to stay vigilant. There may be nothing much on the agenda tonight, but for instance, that $80 million bond is going to come back if it's not back already. Our four times fired for corruption city manager, the mayor and the left side of the dais are just biding their time. There will be more pay to play projects coming in the, in the future. Just watch it. When the city gets in trouble again financially, those who did not vote, that's what we get. You will see warehouses on the way. We have now more than 30 car washes in the city of San Bernardino. There aren't that many dirty cars. So what's going on? That should be a question. This city is the laughing stock of the state. The city is already known for corrupt mayors and pay to play politics, city manager, pay to pay politics, and just follow the money to their pockets. What's the status of Oxbow? It has not moved forward. When is the city going to address that issue? Another year, more toxics, people continue to get sick. Whether it's a council going to do something, you have citizens have come and complained and told you the issues and their concerns. The developer has not had to address that issue or repercussion. The last attempt was vetoed by Valdivia more than two years ago. When are we going to do something about Oxbow? Those people are still getting sick, and you still haven't done anything to take care of that issue. Why is the city taking so long to update the general plan? We need a general plan updated. Due to the plan not being updated since 2006, we are forced to consider warehouses and trucking and parking, uh, truck parking in the middle of residential neighborhoods. We need to have it updated so we can prevent that kind of crap going on. We don't need that in the middle of our city. Thank you. Have a Thank good you. evening. Next speaker, please state your name. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Parks and Recreation, and members of the public. My name is Jose Mendoza, and I'm the commander for the Disabled American Veterans Chapter 12, San Bernardino, California. Here to share some positive news about our chapter. So DAV Chapter 12 is located at 2501 Pacific Street, San Bernardino, California, uh, right in Spiker Park, across the street from San Gregorio High School and the San Bernardino Soccer Complex. So I love that comment that you made earlier. Uh, DAV Chapter 12 has a vast variety of resources for our veterans. We partner up with Feeding America and have food boxes. And uh, I'm sorry about that. We partner up with Feeding America and have a food pantry and food boxes delivered to our veteran community. We also have a spiritual group that meets at 9 a.m. on Tuesdays. Uh, we also have three uh, fishing outings per year, one deep sea fishing, one week-long Eastern Sierra fly fishing trip, and a local fishing trip right here at Fisherman's Retreat, all free to our disabled veterans. We welcome any veteran fitting the parameters to submit the application and join us. DAV, Ch DAV Chapter 12 is very active in our community. This Monday, March 18th, DAV Chapter 12 and its members attended the Vietnam Pinning Ceremony presented by Congressman Pete Aguilar. Supervisor Joe Baca was in attendance along with Director of San Bernardino Department of Veteran Affairs, Ralph DeWarty, and Outreach Specialist Max Hernandez from the San Bernardino Vet Center, all members of Chapter 12 except for the Congressman and Baca. In our upcoming news, DAV Chapter 12 will have a booth at our National Orange Show, Military Appreciation, April 18th, and the event starts at 3 p.m. Please don't forget to register online. DAV Chapter 12 monthly meetings are every second Thursday of the month from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., and we often have a free barbecue or potluck for our veterans. Also, if you're not a veteran but would like to volunteer, we also welcome all volunteers. We have an auxiliary unit of non-veterans that support our veteran community and assist us in our volunteering efforts. It takes a village. In closing, next year, DAV Chapter 12 San Bernardino will have its 100-year anniversary here in San Bernardino. Uh, we'd, love for, we'd love for it to be a momentous event and have all city council, mayor, parks and recreation, and everybody to attend. We'll also be putting a 25-year time capsule commemorating what we have done here at DAV Chapter 12 San Bernardino. DAV Chapter 12, we are here to stay. Thank you. That is my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. 
Uh, my name is Al Palazzo. I'm going to talk about housing. I want to inspire you, but I'm going to try to be objective. I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. I recommend for you to check out the development in Ontario on Inland Empire Boulevard and Turner. It was done by Kaufman and Bro. It's on a grand scale. It's the kind of development that's perfect for the Carousel Mall. The architecture is to the nines. But what's bad about it? It's gated. We don't want to start building gated communities, dividing this part of the population, separating them from another part of the population. And it's surrounded by walls. You don't want to be driving up and down your streets. You want to show off your new homes. We have a new development on Highland Avenue, beautiful homes, but walls. Another location is in Fontana. On Highland Avenue, just west of Citrus, south of the 210, between Hemlock and Savine. Beautiful development, architecture to the nines. The homes are being shown off. No walls, no walls. About one block, about 100 homes. You can go to that location and compare and contrast the scale of that development for one block in San Bernardino and a bigger development, as I previously said. Then you have Kitty Corner, Lennar, a great builder, good architecture, but he has walls one story high. He's hiding the best architecture of that development, the doors and the windows treatment. And then across the street from, from the Lennar and the other one to the south, you have what looks like townhomes. There's a concept for townhomes, but this is like in the 1900s. The row houses you would see in Newark or Philadelphia, we don't want to go that way. That's the ugly. OK, there's graffiti next to the 215 freeway south of Highland, where the railroad expanded. It's about six blocks. I see it every day when I go up and down to the Highland Avenue Bridge. If you don't get rid of that, no developer is going to want to come to San Bernardino. That is an image problem, and we have to change the image of our city. Now, the key concept for building affordable housing, I don't have time to explain. So maybe some other time. Thank you. Right. Next speaker, please state your name. Hello, my name is Yasmin. Um, I wanted to thank the city of San Bernardino for letting us, like, um, letting us build like a new business. Um, I came to represent a new restaurant in this beautiful city of San Bernardino. My dad, Theo, is the owner. The owner has always, who has always worked in the restaurant industry ever since he was in high school, and not, and now he gets to run his own business and and bring his flavor to the community. We have our signature three foot and six foot burritos, asada pastor, chicken, chile verde. If you're a lover of nachos, you have to try our nacho supreme topped off with your favorite meats and jalapeno, guac, and sour cream. We plan on having an official grand opening soon, and we would love to have the community and the mayor along with everyone in this room attend and come try our signature items. Come and see why we are the home of the Big Burrito. Yes, the Big Burrito is here in our very own San Bernardino. Um, Where is it at? Go, okay, yeah, give the location It's going to be, it's, hold on. It's 1725. 1725 um, North Park, West, West North Park um, Avenue. It's across the street where Cal State San Bernardino is at. And Thank you so much. We would like for you guys to go and try it out. Thank you. We certainly will. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Mike Hartley. Uh, back on the council meeting on the uh, February 21st, uh, you guys were discussing Airbnbs and licensing them. And the lady from the city, uh, you, the council, were asking a lot of questions, and the lady from the city 
mentioned code enforcement would handle the problems. And now I have every council meeting have talked about our code enforcement because there is none. Now, code enforcement is going to take care of noise. Code enforcement is going to take care of the parking. What about all the illegal ADUs that we have right now in this city that you guys don't even know about or the garages that have been shut up and they're being rented? You guys aren't getting any revenue from those and the parking is terrible already, but you don't do anything about it. The code enforcement doesn't do anything about it. Now let's go off to the street signs. We used to have street signs. And when we went bankrupt, we spent the money to send labor out there to take the poles and the signs out and throw them away. And now we're replacing them. Now, who's managing the city back then? It, it is, you, it's unbelievable to me that we have to go through this again. Now, Harris's, I, I don't applaud. I, I, it scares me about Harris's, and I'll tell you why. It tells me that a person who's going to give away a $4 million building is not seeing the future of San Bernardino. That's the way I look at it. You may see differently, Fred, but I don't see it that way. What citizen of San Bernardino does have all the information? That's the problem. Now, as far as SBX, that has been the joke of the city for ever since it's been put up. And now, if you want to put lipstick on a pig, go ahead. But it isn't going to change the fact that actually nobody rides it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, did you have some, uh, any written to be read? And for ADA, the um, they're on emails that were sent. We all got copies that were sent via email were provided to we you. We all got copies. Okay. Well, as as far as I can tell, then uh, this meeting is adjourned. We will be adjourning this meeting, and we'll be, we'll be convening in closed session, and we'll return at the end of closed session. I can't tell you exactly when that will be, uh, but we were I'm told we don't okay <laughs> uh, we'll be back um, if we have something to report out in uh, due time thank you very much for attending and you're welcome to wait to see uh, if we have anything coming out of closed session Okay, we're back from closed session. It is 8.49 p.m. Madam City Attorney? We do not have reportable action. There's no reportable action uh, by our City Attorney. The Mayor and City Council, Mayor and City Council acting as, as the successor agency to the redevelopment agency will adjourn at 8.49 to the regular meeting to be held on April 3rd, 2024 at the Feldheim Central Library located at 555 West 6th Street. San Bernardino, California, 92401. Closed session will begin at 4 p.m. and open session will be, will be at 5.